All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Zooplankton Ecology Symposium. Uh, so this symposium is jointly organized by the Delta Science Program, the Delta Stewardship Council, along with our partners uh, from the Interagency Ecological Program, uh, from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the uh, California Department of Water Resources. Just a few housekeeping uh, notes uh, before we start off. Um, looks like everyone's doing a really great job, but we're just going to ask everyone to mute yourself and turn off your video upon entry. Um, this is especially important for anyone calling in on the phone, uh, since it can be very difficult for you to unmute yourself if we have to mute you on our end. Um, so please try to mute your phone uh, when you're calling in. If you encounter any technical issues, um, or are unable to engage in some way, please email engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov, or you can call or text the number on the screen, 916-798-9817. Uh, throughout the symposium, we'll have opportunities for uh, questions or comments from the audience. Um, we're asking people to please try to put those in the chat. So if you want to volunteer to speak, uh, we'd ask you to type your name and maybe your affiliation into the chat, um, and we'll have the facilitators call upon you uh, to give your comment. Um, or you can just type your comment or question into the chat as well, and we can call on you to um, read it aloud if you wish. Uh, I also want to point out that we have a zooplankton listserv for the San Francisco estuary. Uh, so if anyone's interested in joining the conversation after the symposium and uh, kind of joining on a space where we can all come together and talk about zooplankton, zooplankton ecology uh, in this system or related systems, uh, please feel free to join. It's a Google group. You can see the link in the top right of the screen. It's groups.google.com slash g slash zoopfest. Uh, for anyone who's just joining, um, I just want to point out again uh, to please mute yourself and turn off your webcam upon entry. Um, one thing I forgot to for, uh, mention is that we have a designated hashtag for this event. It's hashtag ZoopSimp2020. Uh, so if you are live tweeting or engaging on any other social media platform, please feel free to use that hashtag so we can collect all these uh, social media engagements together. So we'll be starting off in the first talk in just uh, two minutes. Um, so I'll just take a brief pause, um, but Again, for anyone just joining, um, I think the most important thing to note here is if you encounter any technical issues or are unable to use the chat or raise hand to participate, please feel free to email this email address, engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov or call or text 916-798-9817. Hi, Sam. This is Louise. Hi. Hi. Would you like to take this one to two minute transition time for me to put up my slide? Yeah, that's a good okay. idea if you want to. I will go ahead and do that. that. So with that reminder, I'll um, introduce our first speaker. Uh, Louise Conrad is the Deputy Executive Officer for Science at the Delta Stewardship Council. Um, and she will be uh, presenting our introduction to the symposium um, with her talk entitled, Welcome to the Zooplankton Ecology Symposium from Data Science to Climate Change. Um, so we can see your slide, Louise, feel free. Um, actually, did you share the PowerPoint file? I, I did, yes. Would you be willing just to switch to sharing the screen because it won't be recorded? unfortunately, with the file sharing option. Okay. Well, I, I just selected the PowerPoint file. 
I, I, I'm not sure what you want me to do. Um, I just, I'm just sharing my screen, not the file, I think. So if I move through, it should be okay. Um, Sam, or, we can make we can make sure that the PowerPoint is provided. Okay. With with the recording. Okay. Yeah. Um, feel free to go ahead then. Or sorry could, about that. If if you have a different way, that would be fine. You can share it for me, and I and you can advance for me. Um, I think it's fine actually. Yeah, you okay. can feel free to go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, okay, no, it's okay. So, it's okay. Yeah. I want to make sure we do everything right. <laughs> yeah, okay. take it away. Thanks. All right, thank you, Sam. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the Zooplankton Ecology Symposium. We are very excited for the presentations and the discussions that we will have together this afternoon and tomorrow morning. This is a chance for us to dive into the topics that we enjoy most in our careers and these symposia are that chance and is hopefully a chance to engage with people that we don't get to see every day. We're also really excited to see the level of engagement with over well over 100 people on teams this afternoon so thank you so much. I am going to give a brief introduction for the purpose of framing the symposium before handing it over to Karen Kafitz for the next uh, talk on the agenda. So before talking about this, this symposium specifically, I think it is worth acknowledging the mission of the Delta Science Program as it is an important backdrop to what brings us here today. And in the, uh, some of you may know this, um, but the mission of the science program as stated in the Delta Reform Act is to provide the best possible unbiased scientific information to inform water and environmental decision making in the Delta. And it's not on the slide, but the mission, the formal mission statement goes on to say that that mission will be carried out through funding research, synthesizing and communicating scientific information. And that's not the whole mission statement, but um, most of it. And so it's worth acknowledging that these independent scientific workshops and symposia like the one we are here today are really a key mechanism for the Delta Science Program to advance its mission. And um, we are so, again, excited to have this opportunity to focus on zooplankton because a lot of work has been going on in recent years. Um, so getting back to zooplankton, you may remember that um, we polled everyone for your favorite zooplankton as part of the registration form for the symposium. And not surprisingly, uh, cladocerans and copepods dominated the results. However, it's worth pointing out that we discovered two new zooplankton taxa in the process of doing the survey, and those were Wim Kimmerer and Michelle Avila. Wim Kimmerer was also referred to in one case as Kimmerer Wimsonii. And so congratulations to these new members of the zooplankton community. This just goes to show that you are what you study. But in all seriousness, uh, why is this so real? I may not need to tell you this, um, but it is worth a reminder to what brings us here together today is an acknowledgement that zooplankton are a vital and essential component of the ecosystem and the food web and they deserve our focus. And that is our point with this symposium is to bring them into focus. Not to mention that significant resources have been invested over the years in monitoring and in understanding zooplankton and their ecology. And this workshop is a chance to discuss as a group the use of the data that um, that is a lot of work goes into collecting. And then what we are learning regarding their ecology. This is especially important now as tidal wetland restoration efforts, some ongoing and some in, imminent efforts at a fairly large scale are specifically tar targeting benefits for zooplankton communities. So understanding their drivers is going to be key to helping them thrive. And so in this afternoon, we will be hearing about zooplankton research and monitoring in our local San Francisco estuary representatives from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Water Resources, ICF, and UC Davis, and San Francisco State University will present on zooplankton monitoring that we do here in the estuary. We will also hear about local academic research from Wim Kimmerer, 
who will talk about zooplankton and flow. Michelle Youngbluth will speak about feeding and predation in plankton. And we will see some early outputs of the zooplankton synthesis team, which has been really active in recent years, um, from Karen Kafitz, Sam Bashevkin, and Rosemary Hartman. But we are not the only ones studying zooplankton in the system there or in any in systems at large. We have a lot to learn from other systems. And in fact, this symposium agenda was built with a look first at our monitoring network and tools and how we can leverage the data that we collect to assess key questions for management and to understand their ecology. And especially in our current context um, on our planet of invasive species that are pervading many systems um, and a changing climate. And so we will move in the period of just eight hours for our symposium from data science to climate change. In this second half uh, tomorrow, we will hear for, from some world-class zooplankton experts from other systems. Deborah from the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences will speak about zooplankton behavior and movement. Karen Stamieshkin, from the, also from the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences, will speak about carbon and nutrient cycling. And Angela Strecker from Western Washington University will speak about invasive species. And finally, Hans Dom from the University of Connecticut will discuss climate change in zooplankton. This is a really exciting to have this chance for cross-fertilization across systems. But let's not forget that our monitoring programs will not remain static, especially as new tools are emerging. So there is an important sense of the agenda that um, where we will hear from three speakers on new and exciting monitoring technologies. Manu Prakask from Stanford will introduce new low cost microscopy tools that can be used in conjunction with community science. John Ryan from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute will talk about targeted autonomous sampling technologies. And Mark Oman from Scripps Institute of Oceanography will talk about zo the Zooglider, an autonomous optical and acoustic zooplankton sampling platform. And so I am very excited to get into the rest of the ag agenda, but before I do, I wanted to make sure that this group, um, this broad group here, is aware of another important Delta Science Program initiative, and that is that we are very proud to release a new solicitation for science proposals. The notice uh, for our solicitation is available now on our website and is available for public comment. This is the draft notice that is available. Comments are due on November 2nd. And this is in partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation. And between our joint science programs, we have a total of $9 million that is available for funding. We are seeking proposals that advance the 2017 through 2021 science action agenda. And there are two categories of proposals that are listed here on the slides. Um, first, uh, research awards. And the second, which is a new category this year, is for integrated socio-ecological systems awards, uh, which we anticipate would be larger proposals. The letter of intent is also required this year, which is due on December 15th, which is a um, high level look at the topic um, and overall budget for the proposal. And then final proposals due on February 12th. Please send us your comments. If there's anything that is not clear in the solicitation notice, we are eager to, um, to clarify anything that needs clarifying as we target early November for the release of the final solicitation. And so lastly, I just want to say, please enjoy the symposium and dive deep into zooplankton ecology. Uh, I wanna say a big thank you to the Stewardship Council's External Affairs, Brandon Chapin and his team and their facilitation for this afternoon and this morning. Also to all the agencies that helped to plan this and the scientists from those agencies that helped to plan this symposium and a special thanks to Sam Bashevkin for his leadership in bringing us together today. So thank you very much and Sam I will hand it back to you. Thanks Louise. That was really great. Thanks for that really helpful overview. So next up we have Karen Kafitz, um, also from the Delta Science Program 
and Environmental Program Manager. And Karen will be talking um, about our zooplankton synthesis effort with her talk entitled, What We Monitor and Why Surveying Zooplankton in the San Francisco Estuary. Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, can folks see my slides OK? Give me a thumbs up if they're up. I can see them. OK. So I'm Karen Kapitz, and I am a program manager at the Delta Science Program. I'm going to be talking today about what we monitor in the system in terms of zooplankton, why we do that, what we get out of it, and I'm going to talk specifically about some work that I did with the zooplankton synthesis team to bring together more detailed information about the things that we monitor and make that information more accessible to people who want to use the data. So what we monitor and why. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just answer the question right here on the first slide. So what we monitor, well, we monitor zooplankton in multiple size classes across multiple subregions from San Pablo Bay out to the East Delta. We monitor across multiple habitats. Uh, sometimes we just target zooplankton. Other times we target zooplankton concurrent with fish sampling. In addition to a number of long-term monitoring surveys, we also have targeted research studies that are targeting zooplankton. Why? Generally, it's to increase the understanding of food resources that are available to fish. Many of our research priorities in the system are driven by the assumption that some fish species of interest are food limited, and therefore the availability of zooplankton, and especially certain types of zooplankton, is an indicator of good fish habitat. Why else we study zooplankton specifically is that there are a number of habitat restoration and flow actions that are meant to benefit fish species by manipulating the environmental conditions to favor greater availability of zooplankton as food for fish. Of course, in order to assess whether these interventions are working, we have to study the zooplankton. So one other way to answer the question, why do we do long-term monitoring of zooplankton in the system, is that it's mandated. The Environmental Monitoring Program zooplankton study is mandated by water right decision D1641, a ruling by the State Water Resources Control Board regarding various water quality and ecosystem protective requirements necessary for the permitting of the state and federal water projects. Similarly, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biological opinion on the same water projects mandates fish sampling studies in order to track the health of these fisheries. Several of these monitoring studies can currently sample zooplankton, such as the 20 millimeter survey, which targets juvenile delta smelt, the fall midwater trawl and summer tonnet survey, which target a variety of small planktivorous fishes. What we get out of these mandated surveys is quite a lot. These long-term data sets allow us to assess trends in fish food resources from San Pablo Bay to the East Delta. Also, long-term data enables us to detect new introduced species and assess the impact of new species on native and naturalized species, at least in terms of abundance and distribution. Sampling zooplankton concurrently with fish allows us to monitor food supply and better understand fish diets by comparing ambient zooplankton assemblages to what's found in fish guts. And finally, the long-term surveys give us a benchmark of zooplankton in river channels that can be compared to assemblages in tidal wetlands and floodplains to assess how those habitats provide different food resources for supporting fish. In addition to the long-term monitoring surveys, there are several robust research programs that sample zooplankton in the system in order to support management relevant research priorities. For example, researchers looking to align their work with the Interagency Ecological Program Science Strategy, or the Delta Science Program Science Action Agenda, or not shown here, the California Water Action Plan, or with the Delta Science Program Competitive Solicitation, or maybe a Delta Conservancy Solicitation, or a Department of Fish and Wildlife Research Solicitation, are going to come across research priorities that include zooplankton sampling in the system. A few examples of these research priorities I've put on the slide here, things as fundamental as improving understanding of food web dynamics and productivity. To target it, 
such as evaluating the benefits of habitat restoration. Those that reduce uncertainties associated with habitat restoration by, say, determining the contribution of different habitat types to the food web. Reducing uncertainties associated with flow actions by, say, studying relationships between flows and aquatic species. Those that support adaptive management by determining how habitat restoration and water operations affect native fishes. Those that support climate resilience by identifying areas that may act as climate refugia for species of concern, providing the right conditions for fish to live and to eat. And applied work that can be used to characterize numerical models. And those models in turn improve our ability to predict the effects of management actions on species that are hard to measure like delta smelt. These are just a few of the whys of our research. So I'm gonna take a beat here and tell you a little bit about some related talks because the overview I'm giving you today is really a bird's eye view of these programs. But these topics you'll learn more about for the rest of the afternoon. So next up, we have a series of lightning talks where you're going to hear about the IEP long-term monitoring studies, including the ones I've mentioned, the environmental monitoring program zooplankton study, and the fish focus studies that can currently sample zooplankton including the Yolo Bypass Fisheries Study, which tracks seasonal and temporal patterns in the Yolo Bypass floodplain and compares them to the adjacent river channel. You'll also hear from the Fish Restoration Program, which monitors tidal wetland restoration pro projects, pre and post construction, to track fish and their food resources, including zooplankton, of course, to better understand the benefits of these restored habitats to native species. Then, You'll hear about major research efforts out of UC Davis, San Francisco State, and the ICF Consulting Group. After the break, Sam Bashevkin will present on some related work he did on integrating data from the long-term monitoring studies into a user-friendly data set. And Ted Summer will paint more color on the topic that I'm introducing here of how zooplankton data is used to actually inform management. So, Back to what I'm talking about today. This brings me to the opportunity that the zooplankton synthesis team identified, our problem statement, and the work that we did. The opportunity, as I hope you'll see from my talk, is that there's a lot of zooplankton data being collected to address management uncertainties and research questions in our system. The problem, however, is that the methods used to collect that zooplankton data and calculate densities differ a lot between between the studies, making data sets difficult to compare or combine. So to solve this, the zooplankton synthesis team put together a zooplankton integrated data set and a metadata report. This report essentially constitutes a user's guide to zooplankton data in the estuary. And that's what I'm gonna focus most of the rest of my talk on. So at a high level, here's what we wanted to do with the integrated data set metadata report. We wanted to document variation in methods between the sampling programs. We wanted to talk about how those different methods may influence the composition of species or life stages or overall abundance. We wanted to describe the process we took to integrating zooplankton data across long-term monitoring programs into a single user-friendly data set that you'll hear about this afternoon from Sam. Um, and finally, throughout this process, we came across a lot of roadblocks. And so we also wanted to provide in this report some recommendations on the collection and management that could make it easier to combine data sets in the future and to compare data sets that are being collected across these long-term monitoring programs or between long-term monitoring programs and research studies. So here's a little sample of what it looks like when we pull together information about the different long-term monitoring programs. You can see I've listed here the major programs that I've talked about, environmental monitoring program, 20 millimeter survey, fall midwater trawl, summer tow net, fish restoration program, yellow bypass fish monitoring. You can see some of the variation here in the time of year that these programs fit, the size classes that they target, the habitats that they sample. And this table that I'm showing here is just scratching the surface. The actual table comparing all the parameters on which these surveys vary occupies six pages in our metadata report. 
And those six pages don't even capture all the differences in taxa that are identified or the stations that are sampled. For that level of information, you have to go to our GitHub site and find big Excel tables listing all those taxa and, and station identifications and locations. So anyway, one thing I wanted to point out here is that if you look at the months, the chart in the middle, you can see evidence of why combining data from multiple surveys might provide better temporal resolution to look at zooplankton trends than taking a single survey alone. Here you can roughly see another parameter on which these surveys vary from each other in spatial coverage. Each color represents a different long-term monitoring survey from the table I just showed, and each dot is a station that's sampled by that survey. And one thing I want you to consider here, looking at this, is how you can see evidence of why combining data from multiple surveys might provide better spatial resolution to look at zooplankton trends than taking a single survey alone. So what did we specifically put into our metadata report? Well, it starts with providing an overview of the long-term monitoring programs, the ones that you're about to hear about in the upcoming lightning talks. Then we go into descriptions of the different methods used in field sampling, in laboratory handling, counting, and calculating abundance. Essentially, what we're doing here is we're defining all the parameters on which the surveys vary and documenting variation in those parameters. We explain how the variation in each of these methodologies could be expected to affect the samples or the relative abundance of different taxa sampled, whether that's because we think it might undersample particular taxa, bias against species with specific behaviors, whether we think the methodology could introduce or magnify errors in the counts or, or other caveats. The hope is that this documentation will make the data sets more accessible and more usable by people with different backgrounds. So a first year graduate student or a fish biologist with little knowledge of zooplankton techniques could have an easier time engaging with the long term monitoring data and making sense of how to best use it and maybe how to best not use it. Next up in the report, we provide detailed methodological documentation for the integrated data set that Sam will talk about later. Then, based on the challenges we encountered in bringing together this data and metadata, we provide recommendations for zooplankton data collection and management, which I'll touch on at the end of this talk. And as I mentioned before, a six page long table comparing all the long term monitoring programs. And finally, we also put together a table of length weight biomass conversions some some from literature and some from unpublished work by the California Fish and Wildlife. Researchers who are interested in turning abundance data into grams of carbon biomass available to higher trophic levels like fish can do so using a common set of conversion equations. So it turns out that just by going through this exercise of trying to bring all of this information together, trying to bring all of these data sets together. We learned a lot of things. And here is my BuzzFeed clickbait listicle on zooplankton data. If you're going to collect zooplankton data, please do these six things. One, use comparable methods. New programs should work to model their methods off those used by existing programs so that their data are more comparable. More information on the methods used by existing programs can be found in our metadata report. Two, publish data in an accessible format. This is a two-pronged recommendation. First off, please publish your data online. And second, when you do, preferably do it in an open source table format such as CSV rather than database format such as Access. It's much easier to query data and combine data with statistical software such as R if data are already in CSV formats. Also, many databases are proprietary and require licenses in order to crack into the data inside, so that can exclude some of our users. Three, document the taxa identified. Please document the list of taxa and life stages that are identified in your samples and any changes to identification methods 
or species counted over time. As I'll get into again in a second, it can cause a lot of confusion for data users when new species suddenly show up in your data. Did a species previously not present newly appear in the system? Or did a species, or did that species, or sorry, was that species always present but uncounted? And now it started to be counted. Whatever you do, please just write it down for the sake of the next generation of people who are using your data. Four, maximize taxonomic resolution. When we went to combine data from multiple long-term monitoring programs, we had to use a least common denominator approach. That is, if one program identifies Pseudodiaptimus to genus, while the other identifies Pseudodiaptimus forbizae and Pseudodiaptimus marinus, to combine counts from the two programs requires losing the species specificity of the latter. Similarly, some zooplankton programs commonly identified to gross life stage, such as Nopheles juvenile adult, while others do not. If possible to be more specific, then more detailed comparisons can be made using your data. Be explicit about zeros. This relates to the third recommendation in that missing information can confuse the matter of whether a species is appearing newly in the environment or if a species is merely appearing newly in a data set because it wasn't searched for in certain, for, in certain samples. Some programs simply list all the organisms found in a sample rather than all the organisms searched for in a sample. If you record everything searched for, then you'll record true zeros when those species are not found. If an organism is not searched for in one sample, but is searched for in the other, it should be recorded as non-counted rather than as a zero count. Finally, number six, please provide GPS coordinates for sampling locations directly in your data rather than listing as station identifiers. Programs using station identifiers require users to take the extra step of plotting those locations in order to interpret the data spatially. In our integrated data set, which again, Sam will present on shortly, it automatically maps locations of sampling stations for long-term programs. Make it easy to combine your own data with these long-term programs by using decimal longitude and latitude directly in your data set. So I've talked a lot about the metadata report and I'm happy to tell you that you can get your hands on it soon. It's in final production steps before being released as an IEP technical report. Um, it will be posted soon on the IEP website. If you've joined the zooplankton listserv, the Google groups that Sam mentioned at the top, you'll get an announcement. I wanted to acknowledge my co-authors and say thank you so much for all of these folks who lent so much of their time and expertise uh, from working with these different uh, research and monitoring programs to write the metadata report. I couldn't have done this without you. Uh, it's been really a lot of fun and I uh, just wanna say thank you. And if there's a minute or two, I can take some questions. Thanks, Karen. That was really great. Um, we, we have about two minutes, I think, for questions. Um, there was one in the chat, which Rosie addressed a little bit, but maybe it'd be good to hear your take on it too. Um, Adriana Morales asked, could it be possible to standardize the data collection of zooplankton in universities and research organizations? Hmm, to standardize the collection, I think, I think that's not something that we can dictate, but it is really something we're trying to encourage. And I think by providing this information in the metadata report, we're hoping that it will be more straightforward for folks to understand what it means to standardize their, their data collection. Um, the, again, that folks that are new to doing collection in the system, like a first year graduate student, will have a resource that they can look at to better understand the context of what the methodologies are that are being used by other programs so that they can think about how to align those, um, those methodologies. Awesome, thanks, Karen. Um, I think we'll just switch over to the uh, lightning talks now, but uh, if people have additional questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I'm sure Karen would be happy to type answers to them. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, yeah, so now we're going to move into the lightning talk. So these are going to be short five minutes, strictly five minute talks um, from a number of the PIs of our zooplankton surveys. Um, so we're just going to whip through them um, and we will have questions during a uh, group question and answer time at 315. Um, but if anyone has questions about the presentations, feel free to type them into the chat and the presenters can answer them when they're done talking. Uh, so to start out, we will have Arthur Barros from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife talking about the IEP zooplankton study. Okay, thanks Sam. Hi everyone, I'm Arthur. I just started the beginning of this year as the new environmental scientist running the IEP zooplankton study for CDFW. This is a long-term monitoring survey run jointly by CDFW and the Department of Water Resources. And you can find our data at the website you see on the screen, and you can contact me at that email. Uh, that information will also be at the bottom of each of my slides. Uh, next slide. So the study started in 1972, and it was mandated to monitor the water quality and fish food resources in the upper San Francisco estuary by uh, water decision uh, 1379. And then this was later updated again in 1999 by decision 1641, which continues that mandate. Next slide. Our monitoring samples across much of the upper San Francisco estuary from San Pablo Bay in the west all the way to the east and southern delta. We have 14 core stations, which we sample monthly, as well as a few non-fixed stations. And those non-fixed stations move up and down the estuary with the lower salinity zone. Next slide. Uh, our sample collection is done by DWR, which took over this task in the mid 90s. And they used this 60 foot research vessel called the Sentinel. And it, it's operated by them and owned by them. It also has this really cool onboard water quality lab and is able to use all of our zooplankton uh, collecting methods. Next slide. We have three different methods to collect zooplankton. The first two are the mycid and Clark bumpus nets, also called the CB net. And you can see them in the upper left of this slide. They're both attached to a metal sled, which is pulled obliquely through the water uh, behind the Sentinel for 10 minutes. And an and oblique toe is when it's uh, moved up through the water column in a stepwise fashion. So that first net is our largest net, which is the mycid net, and that's on the bottom of that sled. And it uses a 505 micron mesh net, and it targets and collects our larger macro zooplankton, such as mycids and amphipods. The smaller net on top is our CB net, and that uses a 160 micron mesh net, and it collects our adult calanoid copepods, also our larger cyclopoid copepods, our cladocera, and our rotifers. Next slide. The third gear type is a pump system, which uses a utility pump and uh, is attached to the Sentinel, and the vessel stops in the water, and we lower and raise a hose through the water column, which then pumps water through our smallest, uh, our smallest a uh, net mesh of 43 microns, and it pumps almost 20 gallons of water through this net, and that allows us to collect our smallest microzooplankton, things like our smaller cyclopoid copepods, copepod nuclei, and our smaller rotifers. Next slide. After collection, we go ahead and store those samples in formalin and we process them at the CDFW Stockton Laboratory. But while we're in the field, we also collect environmental data such as depth, secchi, temperature, electrical conductivity, and chlorophyll, uh, and chlorophyll data. The chlorophyll data is actually processed by DWR. Uh, once the samples are stored in formalin and brought back to CDFW lab, our personnel there go ahead and process and identify all the organisms and they calculate a catch per unit effort estimate which is basically the number of specific organisms per cubic meter of water we sampled. We also calculate length, sex, and fecundity data for a subset of the mycids we collect, and that data is not yet available or published online. Um, we're working on QCing it and getting it out of there. Every year, we sample and process at least 220 uh, samples for each of the three gear types. And you can find that data at our FTP site Noted here, we provide a catch matrix for each of the three gear types, the mycid, CB, and pump gears. We also provide a station map, study metadata. And now you can also find our uh, data and metadata information 
on the Environmental Data Initiative website and portal. Next slide, please. So over the five decades, this study has gone on. We've seen some, we've witnessed some really big changes in the estuary, notably the invasion of several different copepods, notably uh, Pseudodiaptus forbici, you can see in, on the top plot in red, as well as Limnorthona tetraspinum, see on the bottom plot in purple and orange, which have just become super abundant in the estuary. Next slide. We've also seen an overall massive decline in a lot of the other zooplankton in the estuary, notably Clodosera, rotifers, and mycids. Next slide. And of course, this data set has really supported over 40 years of research in the upper estuary. And this is just a handful of the different publications that have used and relied upon this data set to get pushed out there. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to give a special thanks and shout out to the people who make this possible, notably our senior lab assistants at CDFW Stockton who process all the samples and identify all the organisms. Yugoji, Tina, and Sally, they're super helpful for this. And then of course, our DWR field crew who goes out every month and actually collects these samples and gets all the environmental data, Morgan, Nick, and Eric. And with that, that wraps up my lightning talk. I believe Trishel is next. Thanks, Arthur. Yeah, so next up we will have Trishel Temple talking about the 20 millimeter survey. Feel free to take it away. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I'm Trishel Temple. I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in the IEP Long-Term Monitoring Program. And today I'm going to talk about the zooplankton component of the CDFW 20 millimeter survey. Next slide. So a little background on the survey itself. The 20 millimeter survey began in 1995 and it was designed to monitor the risk of entrainment to young juvenile delta smelts and at the um, water operation facilities in the South Delta. So we're on the water every other week from March until July, and we complete nine sampling events per year. During each sampling event, we'll sample 47 stations in the upper estuary, and that's depicted here on this map. So everything with a black circle has been routinely sampled since 1995. Everything with a purple triangle has been sampled since San Pablo. along with our fish samples. And this work is currently mandated by the 2020 incidental take permit that was issued to the State Water Project. Next slide. So we use what's called a stepped oblique toe to sample the water column. And so the idea is we'll drop our gear to the bottom of the water column and use a series of stepped poles to bring it up. So we sample at each strata for a short period of time. Next slide. So we, collect our zooplankton samples concurrently with our fish samples. And the way we do that is we mount the CB net to the top of our fish net. And so you see that on the picture to the right. The big net is our fish net, and that small net right on top is the CB net. And it's the same net that Arthur just described. We're targeting mesozooplankton with this net. So in that plastic housing, we mount a flow meter to get an idea of how much water is passing through the net during the sample. And then the sample is concentrated at that plastic cod end that you see dangling in the fish net. And one of the really cool things about coupling the zooplankton sampling with our fish sampling is the size of zooplankton targeted by that CB net are the right fish food size for the fish targeted by our fish net. And that's kind of summed up in this great picture taken by one of our taxonomists, Linda Workington. She found this fish in one of our fish samples who's eating a female copepod. You see her, her little egg sacs are sticking out of his mouth. Next slide. So we collect over 400 zooplankton samples per year, and this takes our lab staff about 1,500 hours to process. And each of these samples contains thousands of organisms. And we try to identify about 6% of them. So this is a really time intensive process that has led to a really robust data set. Next slide. Um, our data does a really good job of detailing the springtime zooplankton composition in the open water habitats of the upper estuary. And our data has been used in many ways, including fish diet studies, and it's been incorporated in, into many synthesis efforts. And here's just a couple of examples uh, of papers that included the 20 millimeters of plankton sample. Um, 
and mm. most of these examples are related to Delta smelt food, but it can be used for many other purposes as well. Next slide. So our data is available in, through, in a few ways. Uh, through our 20 millimeter survey website, you can find more information about the survey in general. You can also find our full data set and a few data visualizations like the one on the right. And then the 20 millimeter data was also incorporated into the integrated zooplankton data set, which we've heard a little bit about already today and we'll hear more about later. And there's some really great data visualizations of the integrated data set available through the zooplankton shiny app. And that is everything I have. I'll hand it over to Christina. Thanks, Trishelle. That was great. Um, so next up, like she said, we have Christina Birdie, also from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, talking about the summer tonit and fall midwater trawl. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, hi, I'm Christina Birdie, and I am going to talk to you, like Sam said, the zooplankton aspect of summer tonit and fall midwater trawl. Next slide. Okay, so summer tonit and fall midwater trawl both are conducted by CDFW. They began as fish surveys to monitor age zero striped bass. Summer tonet started in 1959, fall midwater in 1967, and they later added zooplankton monitoring to pair fish with invertebrate, invertebrate sampling. And this allows us to compare fish resource availability to fish diet. Both surveys sample in open water channels and shoals, doing a stepped um, oblique toe for 10 minutes that Trishel said or talked about. Uh, we collect environmental variables such as secchi and turbidity, top and bottom temperature, and electrical conductivity. All lab processing is similar to the IEP zooplankton study and 20 millimeter, and the zooplankton and fish data for both of these surveys are publicly available. Next slide. Okay, so summer tonet survey started a mesozooplankton sampling in 2005, and they do this by adding a CB net attached to the top of a tonet sled, similar to 20 millimeter. Zooplankton is collected at all 40 summer tonet sampling sites, ranging from San Pablo up into the Sacramento Deepwater Ship Channel and down into the South Delta. Samples are collected bi-weekly from June to August, and we collect uh, 240 mesozooplankton samples per year. Next slide. Fall midwater trawl added meso and macrozooplankton study or sampling beginning in uh, 2007 with pilot studies. And they do this by um, using a sled with a CB net and a mycid net attached. Zooplankton is collected at 32 of the total 122 fall midwater sampling sites, and we collect 128 samples per year of each CB and mycids, mycid samples. Surveys are conducted monthly from September to December, and then also in the lab, we record um, mycid and amphipod lengths, and also mycid and sex fecundity data. Next slide. Okay, so we count, measure, and collect a whole bunch of critters. What can we do with all this data? Well, for these surveys and also long-term monitoring surveys in general, we're able to look at intra and inter-annual species abundance and composition and how abiotic and biotic factors may be affecting those. We are also able to look at distributional patterns with these species, uh, summer tonet, fall midwater, and also I believe 20 millimeter samples up into the deep water ship channel and South Delta. And this is beyond some of the uh, survey, uh, some of the distributions of some of the surveys. By coupling zooplankton, avail zooplankton monitoring and fish monitoring, we're able to look at prey availability and fish diet. We are also able to look at the effects of management actions on the zooplankton community, such as the uh, Cicene Marsh Salinity Control Gate action, which began in uh, summer of 2018, and we added additional zooplankton monitoring for that. Uh, by looking at mycid and amphipod lengths, this allows us to get biomass per unit effort in addition to um, catch per unit effort. 
The uh, MySID fecundity data allows us to look at how that may vary between different MySID species. And then, of course, it allows us to um, detect any invasive species or see how um, there might be changes between invasive and native species as well. Okay, I may have a couple seconds left. And so with that, I want to thank our wonderful taxonomists and in lab, including Sally Skilton, uh, Spencer Burning the Day, Cole Anderson, Maria Velasquez, Jessica Jimenez, Trisha Bippis, and then of course the um, heaps of people that collect all these data, specifically the field leads for Summer Tonight, which is Tim Malinick, and uh, Fall Midwater, who is uh, James White. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks, and I'll hand it off to Dan. Thanks, Christina. Um, so next up, we have Dan Ellis from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, talking about the Fish Restoration Program. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Ellis, and uh, I'm the invert biologist for the Fish Restoration program monitoring team, and today I'll be talking about our zooplankton sampling. Uh, next slide. Uh, our program is housed under the IEP. My group itself is uh, under CDFW, but we have many partners at DWR, and our work is carried out pursuant to water operations, and our goal is to restore 8,000 acres of tidal wetlands. And this is for the benefit of listed fish, um, namely Delta smelt and Chinook salmon, uh, the winter run. Uh, next slide. So the actual fish restoration program itself, we are tasked with designing and planning wetland restorations. We then monitor those pre and post. Uh, those sites are adaptively managed. And again, this is for the benefit of Delta smelt and juvenile Chinook salmon uh, food production. Next slide. All of our sites can be seen here. We work in the North uh, Delta Arc, and each of those black ellipses circles around a subregion. Each subregion has a reference wetland, which was selected to be uh, the most natural habitat that's available. Uh, many of you will know that that's challenging to find in the Delta, but we've done our best here. Each of those blue sites are our restored wetlands, so we're excited to say that each of our subregions now has at least one restored wetland. And we, you can see as well that some of our, our subregions, that is, have uh, restorations that are still in progress. Next slide. So for all of the methods I'm going to be discussing today, you can refer to this document. I'm happy to share it if you reach out to me. Uh, we also have uh, video demos which are in progress and a number of uh, written SOPs that we can just easily send your way. Uh, next slide. Um, similar to the other groups in this um, uh, that are presenting today's lightning talks. We use 150 micron mesh net and cottons. Our acrylic housing is uh, roughly 15 centimeters in diameter, and we are using a general oceanics flow meter, which is housed in that housing. Next slide. Similarly, for our macro zooplankton, we have a 500 micron mesh net and cottons. Um, that has a 50 centimeter diameter ring at the front and the same flow meter. Next slide. So for the majority of our sampling, because we're in very shallow habitat, we're typically sampling the surface water, but uh, we have a number of different sampling methods because of the inability to access some sites via boat and also because of the water's depth. And in some situations, uh, four foot deep mud, you're kind of restricted with how you can sample. So if, next slide. Uh, the first image in this next slide shows roughly where we sample when we're towing via boat. And this is for most of our sampling. But some of our sites, um, we use what we call a flux method, which refers to when water is flowing off the site fast enough that it'll turn a flow meter and we will actually sample that water that way. We also sample via kayaks. Here you can see me paddling, but we also have one that one of our team members put a motor on. Uh, the fourth method is cast and retrieve. So it's blocked now, but you can see you're throwing the um, zoop net as far as you can and then retrieving it and doing that repeatedly. Usually we're looking for about 100 meters if we can do it. And uh, the downside of that method is that there's a little bit of user variability, but the upside is that it could be used in any um, habitat. And then finally, we have hand towing um, that can either be waiting as shown in the photo or I might be doing the um, towing from land. Next slide. 
Now, when we get back to the lab, we have data that look like, or we have samples that look like this. We're looking for a minimum of 400 individuals per sample. And in a year like 2019, we collected 700 invert samples. Probably about 500 of those were zooplankton split between meso and macro. We do not sample for microzooplankton. Next slide. Uh, I'm not showing you this to get into the nitty gritty. I just want to show you some of the data that we produce. Here you can see that we split the sites. Sorry about that. Um, we split the sites by subregion from those maps before and by year. And so this is the mean log CPUE. Next slide. Uh, here is some of our data. Here you can see the relative abundance and those asterisks apply to when our sampling is slightly different from IEPs, but the Shiny app is actually working to fix some of those um, crosswalking issues. Next slide. This is a uh, macrozooplankton with the same asterisks applied. And again, you can see our uh, relative abundance data. Uh, one thing I'm not showing you today is that we also do measure lengths uh, for our macrozooplankton, at least for a subset. Next slide. Uh, with that, I want to thank our funders, all of our volunteers. We've had many. Um, we've had many of you and others uh, providing input for what became our methods. We have a number of excellent taxonomists, as, have, as has already been said, at the Stockton office. Um, and I want to thank my team. Uh, so next slide. And I also want to mention that we have a couple ES openings coming up in our shop. So if you're interested in joining this amazing team, uh, reach out to us. And uh, with that, I'm done. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, up next, we have a pre-recorded presentation by Jesse Adams from the California Department of Water Resources talking about the YOLO Bypass Fish Monitoring Program. Hello, and thanks for attending my lightning talk on long-term zooplankton monitoring in the Northeast San Francisco Bay Delta Estuary. This monitoring program is a component of the Yolo Bypass Fish Monitoring Program, run by the Aquatic Topology Section within the Division of Environmental Services at the Department of Water Resources. Today, I'll be talking about the goals and mandates that drive our program, why we collect zooplankton, as well as some history and specific items like methodology and types of species targeted by our sampling efforts. First, I'll give a short background system, Yellow Bypass, why it's important, how it's changing due to things like climate change, resource use, and invasive species. The Yellow Bypass, situated in Yellow Basin, is a flood bypass that protects the city of Sacramento from flooding through a system of levees and weirs that acts to divert water away from the city and nearby communities during flood events. Historically, such flooding was common during winter months in Yellow Basin and would typically result in seasonal marsh habitat covering tens of thousands of acres in the northern Sacramento Valley. This provided important habitat for fish, waterfowl, migratory birds, and abundant terrestrial and aquatic plant and invertebrate species. However, as people change the landscape through draining, clearing, and levying, create agricultural lands and protect urban areas from flooding, and water is diverted for agricultural and urban use, floodplain habitat has become increasingly fragmented and fundamentally altered by changes in hydrology, water quality, and the introduction of invasive species. Climate change further threatens the Yolo Bypass ecosystem through higher average temperatures, prolonged drought, the effects of increased wildfires, and the potential for salinity intrusion due to rising sea levels and decreased delta outflows. For context, the image at the bottom right shows a depiction of the Northeast Delta in 1850, likely near Cache Slough and the Sacramento River. While, while the above photo shows what is probably very near the same area as seen today. On the left, you can see the Yolo Bypass view looking north, with the tow drain paralleling the larger deep water ship channel and agricultural land on the right and west Sacramento in the distance. So why does the Yolo Bypass Fish Monitoring Program collect zooplankton? A key study question of the program investigates the significance of seasonal floodplain habitat to native fishes including available dietary resources and how they change over time. Zooplankton are a key resource for many fish, including smelts and juvenile salmonids, as well as a critical component to the overall aquatic food web. In addition, Yolo Bypass has been identified as a high restoration priority by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service biological opinions for Delta smelt and winter and spring run chinook salmon, both of which rely considerably upon zooplankton for at least part of their life histories. Furthermore, baseline data from our program, which includes lower trophic organisms like zooplankton, 
are critical for evaluating the success of several restoration projects in the Yellow Bypass outlined in California Eco Restore. Zooplankton are just one component of the food map that the Yellow Bypass Fish Monitoring Program collects data on. We also collect water quality along with other lower traffic components such as phytoplankton, drift invertebrates, and larval fish and eggs. And of course, we sample fish using a variety of methods to assess different life history stages and habitat use, as well as seasonal and interannual population and community trends. The Yellow Bypass Fish Monitoring Program collects samples in the Yellow Bypass from just below Fremont Weir at the north end, Cache Slough at the south end. The lower trophic component of the program, which started in 1998, generally collects samples year-round on a bi-weekly basis at two permanent locations, the Rotary Screw Trap in the Toes Range and on the Sacramento River at Sherwood Harbor, using standardized protocols since 2001. So plankton are collected either by boat or with sufficient flow from a fixed platform such as the Rotary Screw Track deck or the dock at Sherwood Harbor. Sampling consists of 150 micron subsurface horizontal net toes targeting adult logic zooplankton such as copepods and podocerans, lasting for a duration of five minutes or three minutes during high cell to quarter brief flows, and a 50 micron subsurface horizontal net toe targeting nauplii and micro zooplankton species such as rotifers, lasting three minutes or one minute during high cell to quarter brief flows. Shown here are the program's core lower traffic sampling locations. The two stations were chosen primarily to contrast differences over time in abiotic conditions and lower traffic food web between the Yellow Bypass and Lower Sacramento River. So to summarize, PWR's aquatic ecology section runs the Yellow Bypass Fish Monitoring Program, focusing on assessing and gathering baseline data in the aquatic food web in the Yellow Bypass. The primary goal of our long-term monitoring of zooplankton communities is to assess food availability and quality for native fish that use the bypass. We also hope to improve the usability of our data, particularly with regards to synthesis efforts and providing scientifically robust data sources which are easily accessible to users. Thank you for listening to my talk. And I just quickly want to thank everyone in the aquatic ecology section at DWR and our agency partners and collaborators in the IEP. And if there's any time for questions, I'll take them down. All right, thank you, Jesse, from the past. Um, Next up, we have Calvin Lee from ICF, who will be talking about ICF FAST. <laughs> Hi. Uh, sorry, one second. Hi, um, my name is Calvin Lee. I'm a senior biologist with ICF. Uh, I'm a member of the Fish and Aquatic Science Team, also known as FAST. I'm going to go over briefly our projects that use zooplankton sampling to answer questions about food web dynamics and habitat suitability in Sassoon Bay and the Delta. Uh, next slide, please. So our sampling gear for our zooplankton collection is pretty basic. Uh, we use two CB nets in a welded frame. The larger one is for macro zooplankton, such as mysids and amphipods, and the smaller one is for mesozooplankton, so your copepods. Uh, the larger net has a 500 micron mesh, and the smaller one has a 150 micron mesh. Uh, we used to use two nets with the same diameter size, but we switched over to a smaller mesozooplankton net, as shown on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Our largest study is the Directed Outflow Project, which is a collaboration between state, federal, and university groups to study the effects of outflow on Delta smelt in the estuary. ICF's role in this project is to evaluate habitat quality. Uh, we pair with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service EDSM crew. So while they trawl for Delta smelt, we collect water quality data, phytoplankton, nutrient samples, and of course, mycid and zooplankton samples. Uh, next slide, please. So we pair with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for three stations in five different regions of the estuary every week. Within each station, we'll sample the channel surface, the channel deep, so that's the lower half of the water column in channels greater than 20 feet, and shoals, which have a depth of 10 feet or around 10 feet, if those habitats are present at the site. Uh, next slide, please. This study began in uh, this study began in 2017 as the X2 lower trophic study, which ran for a few months in the fall. In 2019, we expanded sampling from the beginning of April to the end of November. You'll select and process a pretty decent amount of samples. Next slide. 
Our next study is the Tidal PAR study. Uh, this study is in collaboration with the DWR and researchers at UC Davis looking at if and how Chinook salmon PAR utilize tidal marsh habitat in Zasun Bay before they head out to sea. Uh, we sample shoals, distributaries, and terminal channels using MMU trawl, looking at habitat that's less than 10 feet deep. Uh, we work with a PhD student at UC Davis, Thiago Sanchez, to collect and process eDNA samples uh, to detect any fish in the area that we might not catch in the trawl. Um, and we also do zooplankton sampling, of course. Um, the salmon are sent to Anna Sterlich at UC Davis for gut content and isotope analysis, and we process the mycid and zooplankton samples ourselves. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a map of some uh, preliminary catch data for the three years we've run this study. You'll see that we caught quite a bit of salmon in 2019 in the marshes in the bay. Uh, so again, just reiterating with every fish trawl, we'll also do a zooplankton trawl as well too, just to kind of look at the gut content and what's in the environment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another component of the tidal PAR study is a cage study. So we have pit tagged salmon inside these cages in different parts of Sassoon Bay and Marsh, and we track their growth throughout time. Uh, we use a throw net to do zooplankton sampling around these cages. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any pictures or video of this in action, but basically we have this rope tied to a net, kind of bunch the net up and kind of discus toss it out in the water and pull it back in. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a map of some of the sites where we had cages. Uh, so you'll see they're all in marsh areas within various sloughs and islands. Uh, we also have a lot of other sites up in Sassoon Marsh as well too. Uh, next slide, please. So our final study, which has a zooplankton sampling component is the Thule Red study. Uh, we're using carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis to look at food web dynamics of fish in relic marshes, breached, breached wetlands, and pre-restoration sites. So we trawl for fish and then we'll collect pretty much everything that might be an input into the food web. So this includes vegetation, phytoplankton, zooplankton, insects, and benthic organisms. Uh, next slide, please. So this map just shows the six different locations that were sampled for the study. Uh, next slide. So within each site, you'll see we'll sample inside the marsh as well as some of the shallow shoals just outside the entrance to the marshes. Uh, for the zooplankton isotope analysis, we'll use a bongo net setup. Uh, these samples aren't preserved. They're kept on ice and then sent to UC Berkeley for isotope analysis. Um, so we also do the regular zooplankton sampling just to figure out what zooplankton species are present. Um, next slide, please. So that's pretty much it for our studies that sample zooplankton. I just want to quickly acknowledge our staff. I uh, wouldn't be able to do all the sampling and processing without their hard work. I'd also like to thank all our partners and funders as well too. And finally, I'd just like to say that, you know, we're open to collaborating with all different groups and organizations. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about anything. And that's it for me, thank you. Great, thanks, Kelvin. Uh, next up, we have Kim Luke from UC Davis, who will be speaking on zooplankton sampling and the cash Lindsay slough complex. Hi there, I'm Kim Luke. I'm a junior specialist in the Duran Lab at the Center for Watershed Sciences at UC Davis. Um, with the help of my colleague, Chris Jasper, I just wanted to share some of the zooplankton research we've been involved in, uh, particularly zooplankton sampling in the cash Lindsay slough complex observing trends across drought and flood water years. Uh, next slide. So our zooplankton studies are a part of the ARC project and that gets its name from the ARC shape of the study sites you see outlined in white. Uh, it includes Sassoon Marsh, the Lower Sacramento River, the Cash Lindsay Slough Complex, which is outlined in the black box, uh, and the Yolo Bypass. The ARC project is a long-term monitoring program in the North Delta and we utilize water quality, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and fish assemblage studies. Uh, and we are currently funded by the Solano, water, or Solano County Water Agency. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the ARC project has a few goals. Uh, one is to better understand the effects of tides, seasonal flow pulses, and regional water export on water quality and food webs. Uh, and another is to see how water quality, food web productivity, and fish assemblages 
very temporally. And that would be comparing trends in drought versus wet years uh, and also spatially. So comparing and then comparing restoration sites within those sloughs to adjacent ones. And I just want to point out this image here shows the same site only one month apart and they have very different phytoplankton blooms. So we're really interested in understanding how these different blooms affect zooplankton. Uh, next slide. Uh, so our study site uh, within the Cache Lindsay Slough complexes are shown here. In the upper outlined area, you have the Cache Slough complex, which includes Haas, Cache, and Eulatus, or sorry, Eulatus. And then the lower one is the Lindsay Slough complex, and that's made up of Barker, Calhoun, Cut, and Lindsay Sloughs. Uh, samples are taken monthly from these uh, areas, and they've been sampling since 2012 up until the present. Uh, we take samples along the length of the sloughs and upper, middle, and lower reaches to compare. Next slide. So when we're out on the water, uh, we're sampling by towing a half meter wide conical net uh, with a 50 micron mesh. Uh, the net is towed for 20 meters and samples are collected one meter below the surface. We also attach a mechanical flow meter to estimate the volume that we've sampled. And uh, after 20 meters, the nets pulled in, rinsed, and the zoops are collected in analogene. And then they're fixed with formaldehyde and dyed with rose bengal. And we do this type of sampling because it's easy to replicate at multiple sites at varying depths, and we're able to do a lot of trawls in one day. Next slide, please. Uh, and then once we're in the lab, you know, efficiency is the name of the game. Um, we're filtering through a 150 micron mesh. And we're using a subsample aliquot from a known value, typically 500 milliliters. And we count and ID all zooplankton, excluding Nopliae, until three species or genera have exceeded 100 individuals. Um, and that includes copepidites and adults. And then we use the flow meter data from trawling to estimate field sample vol um, volume. And then we extrapolate zooplankton abundance from our aliquot data. Uh, and what you see in this picture here is a pretty good example of the clodocerin and copepods we find in our samples. And we're filtering to find the largest individuals uh, because we're interested in pelag uh, pelagic food web productivity. Next slide, please. Uh, and, you know, the ARC project has produced some zooplankton uh, results through thesis work of Jacob Montgomery and Chris Jasper, uh, but we do have quite an archive of samples that need to be processed and analyzed. Um, and we've recently modified our process to become more efficient. And we're prioritizing samples to answer a few questions. You know, how communities from peak drought and wet years compare? How communities compare across upper slough sites during peak phytoplankton blooms? And also how zooplankton trends compare with fish recruitment? And that's really where I'm coming in as a new JS. Um, just in the past few months, I've already processed uh, priority samples for our first question that we want to answer. And I'll be focusing on that for uh, the next year as a junior specialist and as a master's student. Um, next slide, please. So thank you. Um, thanks for listening to my talk and thank you to all of our funders and supporters and especially Chris Jasper, who's been guiding me through this process. So thank you and off to Wim. Thanks, Kim. That was great. Uh, so last but not least, we have Wim Kimmerer from San Francisco State University who will be talking about um, procedures in the Kimmer lab. Okay, can I have the slides? All right, here we go. So this is um, San Francisco Estuary. The star shows the EO Center, and um, those orange lines and little squares and triangles show some of the places we visited to sample zooplankton. Next slide, please. So we'd like to put the food web into some kind of context here. Um, the food web on the left focuses on, on the zooplankton, on the, on the copepods in the middle. And uh, we're interested in who eats whom and how much. And in, in the top there, we're interested in where they are and where they go and in, in vertical and horizontal directions, their birth and their growth, and also over on the left, uh, the mortality rates. Um, next slide, please. I, and I'll just, I'll come back to, I'll use those diagrams as uh, sort of sort of uh, markers. Here we've got the, the uh, longitudinal and vertical distribution and, and abundance uh, as represented by the multiple copepods there. And we use a lot of net sampling, um, either oblique or horizontal or vertical. And when we sample with nets, 
we uh, we use a flow meter, but we, we don't calibrate the flow meter. We just make sure it works well and it's and it's maintained. Um, and on the vertical toes, we use the flow meter just to get an average net efficiency, not for each toe. Um, we sample from boats. We sample from uh, <clears throat> from uh, harbor. I mean from docks. And uh, when we sample, we we uh, and we also sample at night. There's Cheryl Patel, who'll be one of the um, organizers a little later. Um, we um, we pickle the samples in formaldehyde usually and uh, label inside and out um, of the jars. Next slide, please. Some more abundance and distribution sampling. Here's Ken, Karen Kafetz hauling a bucket uh, for either for water or for microzooplankton. Um, we sample on uh, using pumps in the middle, the lower middle, and uh, we sample in various locations. We also sample with uh, water bottles in the upper right. And um, and even once with a ponar gram or a benthic copepods. Next sample. Next slide, please. For uh, processing our abundant sample, we use a variety of methods, but um, but we don't um, we don't always use exactly the same. So first of all, we uh, we subsample and rinse the sample um, so we can. We don't have formaldehyde floating around in the, in the lab. And we use a simple pipette or a splitter to split the sample and, uh, and subsample it. And we put them in counting trays, which are, uh, as in the lower left, you can see uh, one of those counting trays. We have them made. Um, and we when we use uh, dissecting scopes. The picture in the middle, this is the only picture you'll ever see of me in, on, on a microscope these days. Um, and on the right, uh, we, we use, um, Inverted scopes for microzooplankton, and we also use uh, other kinds of scopes like uh, like fluorescence, epifluorescent scopes. Um, we we usually stage our counting, meaning that we take a subsample, count everything in it, and take repeated subsamples to get enough of the organisms we're particularly interested in. Uh, sometimes that's necessary for doing things like uh, mortality rates, where we need very high counts, and we don't want to count everything in every every subsample. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a comparison of our data with data from the IEP long-term monitoring program for 2006-2007. And you can see uh, some differences, but overall the general patterns are pretty similar. This is 2006 on the left, 2007 on the right, three different species. And um, for the most part, uh, they, they tell a similar story, but, uh, not, but not identical. And some of those differences we see are are explainable by uh, by the differences in methods. Um, but remember that uh, we're using half meter nets towed uh, vertically and comparing with a CB net towed uh, for, for 10 minutes uh, obliquely. Um, so that's that's pretty encouraging. Next slide, please. So this is how we do growth rates. Um, we, um, we collect samples of zooplankton, we size fractionate them, and we put uh, subsamples of the size fractionated samples in various containers. And at the top, we either incubate them in, uh, <clears throat> in, in, in situ in, in these baskets in, in bottles or cubitainers, or in bottles on a rotating wheel that's, that goes in and out of a, a water bath in the upper right. And then in the center, we look at the sample um, with a, a video microscope. We arrange the sample and we take a photograph. And here are two photographs on the left of a zero time sample and a sample after I think 72 hours of incubation. And you can see the, the change in size. And we use the change in size to estimate the growth rate. And this is uh, Steph Owens up there on the lower right with all her master's degree samples that she ran. Um, so it takes a lot of samples to do this. Uh, next slide, please. We'll, we also do a lot of feeding studies um, in the upper right part corner of the slide, we, uh, we incubate usually in bottles and, uh, <clears throat> and we look at rates of change in abundance of phytoplankton or microzooplankton using microscopy. And in the lower left, we do the same sort of thing uh, in beakers for uh, grazing rates of clams on phytoplankton, microzooplankton or copepod nuclei. Uh, next slide, please. We also use various tracers, primarily DNA, to look at uh, feeding relationships uh, at the top, across the top, Cheryl Patel again doing some uh, sorting for uh, 
extractions. And then uh, the, uh, the little tiny sample in the vial is several hundred copepods worth of DNA that's going into the high, th high throughput sequence sequencer in the background. And at the bottom, we also use uh, various stains and uh, natural uh, tracers and, and uh, uh, stable isotopes to uh, try to identify feeding relationships. And the next slide, please. I'd like to thank all our many, many, many funders, just about every agency you can think of, um, and to DSP and Sam for the, and, and Karen for uh, putting on this great symposium. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Wim. And thanks everyone who just presented. That was a really amazing set of talks lined up one after the other. I think it went really well. Um, so let's take a break now. Uh, let's take about a 10 minute break and aim to come back here at 2.35. So we're running about five minutes uh, late in the agenda, but we have plenty of time to make up for that. So we'll see you back at 2.35.
All right, are folks trickling back? We ready to go, Sam? Yeah. All right. Please go ahead. Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to get that overview of all the zooplankton monitoring going on in the estuary first up. Um, and my name's Rosemary Hartman, and I am from the Department of Water Resources, and I'll be your moderator for this next session. Next up, we have um, the heart and soul behind not only this event, but the whole uh, zooplankton synthesis effort. Um, Mr. Sam Bashevgin, Senior Environmental Scientist Specialist from the Delta Science Program. Um, and he is going to be telling us all about the effort to build an integrated data set of zooplankton monitoring in the upper San Francisco estuary. So take it away, Sam. Oh, and sorry, I should say Dr. Sam Bashevkin. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Rosie. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming back after the break. Um, so like Rosie said, I'm now going to talk about the integrated data set and how we built it and put everything together, as Karen alluded to in her talk this morning. So as Karen mentioned, there are a number of surveys within the Interagency Ecological Program that monitor zooplankton in the upper estuary. These include um, all the surveys we heard about um, right before this, the 20 millimeter survey, environmental monitoring program, fall midwater trawl, Fish Restoration Program, Summer Tonet, as well as the Yolo Bypass Fish Monitoring Program. And for this integrated data set, we're going to focus on the first five of these surveys since they have the most similar methodology um, that we're able to integrate their data. So first of all, why should we integrate data in the first place? It can help improve the spatial and temporal resolution of your data set. It can help cover a greater diversity of habitat types for important habitat studies. It'll increase the power, statistical power you have for analysis and modeling just due to the large increase in the amount of data you'll then have. And a side benefit we discovered is that it encourages method standardization as we encountered issues or struggles in combining the data. Um, that's how we were able to come up with those recommendations for future surveys and for refining our current surveys. However, we encountered a number of challenges in integrating the data. The first one is just where to find it. Um, many of these data sets are posted in different locations, whether it's FTP servers um, or uh, agency websites. So we had to find where they all were and write code to pull them from different locations. There are also differences in methods, which Karen talked about as well as changes and methods within each survey over time. There are different data formats, um, differences such as long or wide data, as well as the um, actual format it was uh, posted in, whether it's an Excel file, a CSV file, or an access database. There are differences in taxonomic resolution, um, and I'll talk about that more later. Um, and there are also changes in this taxonomic resolution over time. And that's the biggest encounter, uh, the biggest problem we encountered are those two issues, which I'll spend a lot of time talking about. Lastly, there's conflicting user needs for an integrated data set. Not everyone will want to use this data set for the same purpose. Um, so it's important to try to tailor an integrated data set to the uh, most important users and make sure that everyone can take advantage of it. Um, lastly, I want to point out that writing code to solve all of these challenges at once is immensely valuable because it saves so much time from every individual researcher having to tackle these problems on their own. Um, so that was a major motivation for the process is building one pipeline to solve all these problems um, so everyone can use the same approach. So the overall workflow for our data integration um, is as follows. So we started out with um, data sets that were downloaded from their location online, and the users can specify which ones they want to include. We then standardize the environmental variables and taxonomic names to create a set of comparable data sets. 
which are then merged together by simply stacking them on top of one another. And lastly, we allow users to filter the data based on a variety of parameters and we resolve issues like these differences in taxonomic resolution to create a final data set for the user. So what do I mean by taxonomic resolution? So if you look at a sample of calanoid copepods, there are a number of different ways you could count it. You could just count um, the total number of calanoids in the sample to get one high level view of what's there. You could dive a little deeper to the genus level and count the number of pseudodiaptimus versus the number of tortanus individuals in the sample. Or you could look at the finest level, um, the species level and identify um, every individual to the species level. So why does this taxonomic resolution matter when integrating data sets? Uh, for this, I'm gonna show three hypothetical surveys. So the first survey um, identifies all of the individuals um, at the species level um, indicated by the orange labels. The second survey will just identify them at the genus level and the last survey will identify them only at the um, order level of calanoid. And if we wanted to compare these data sets together, you can see we actually have no categories in common across the three data sets. So we clearly have to do some sort of taxonomic wrangling or um, summing to create uh, variables that can actually be combined across the data sets. And what's difficult is creating a generalized solution that be can be written in code and applied to any taxonomic situation of this type that's encountered. So this is the solution that we um, came up with, and I'm gonna illustrate it with a real example using three of the surveys, EMP, Fallman, Water Trawl, and 20 millimeter, focusing on the genus Tortanus. So EMP and fall midwater trawl count um, these individuals at just the genus level, just as Tortanus SPP, whereas the 20 millimeter survey actually identifies down to the species level and will count Tortanus discodatus as well as Tortanus dextrilobatus and any unidentified members of that genus as Tortanus SPP. So for someone interested in doing a community analysis, um, our solution will sacrifice taxonomic resolution to create a comparable data set. So what this does is it just creates a category at the level of the genus that we call all Tortanus, um, which for 20 millimeter is just a sum of the three categories they count, whereas for EMP and Fall Midwater Trawl, it's just the exact count that they record. However, for someone who's interested in getting and retaining all possible information on this genus, we have a separate solution which will calculate comparable categories while retaining the taxonomic resolution of the source data sets. So this will again create this all Tortanus category, um, which you can see on the bottom, but it'll also retain the species level counts from the 20 millimeter survey. Um, and it will flag um, those counts or those categories which are not represented in all source data sets. So those species level categories are not present in fall midwater trawl or EMP samples. So there's a lot of flagging um, that you get from this solution. So which taxonomic solution do you need? So if you wanna go the community um, approach, this is for someone who wants to analyze the community composition at whatever taxonomic level lets me use all of these data sets. But for someone interested in specific taxa, they might might want all possible data on those taxa of interest. The community approach will provide consistent taxonomic categories, while the taxa approach will calculate total CPUE for each higher taxonomic level. So for the community approach, no individual plankton are counted more than once, but an important note for this specific taxa approach is that some individual plankton will appear in multiple nested taxa. So a count in calanoid will also appear as a count in the copepoda category. So the community approach, as I said, will sacrifice some taxonomic resolution while the specific taxa approach will preserve taxonomic resolution and also create categories that are comparable across all source data sets. And lastly, the community approach will remove taxa with no relatives in other data sets, 
So for example, FERP has an analid category that no other data sets record. So those data are just removed uh, when the data are combined under this approach. Whereas for the specific taxa approach, we just label taxa, flag them, um, those that are not comparable across all data sets. We, sorry, we warn, we label are comparable across all data sets and also warn about those that are not. So you get all information you need. Now, another issue we've encountered is changing taxonomic resolution over time. So the list of taxa counted in each sample has changed for a number of these surveys, um, often but not always due to species invasions. When a new species shows up, suddenly we need to start counting them at the species level to keep track. And this can bias analyses of community change over time if we don't address it. How can we look at changes in community composition over time if the taxonomic diversity of the data itself is changing over time. So we came up with a solution to this as well. And what we do is we just reduce the taxonomic resolution of each taxon to the lowest resolution at any point in time. So I'm going to use um, these two species as an example, Oithona davisei and Oithona similis. So from 1972 to 1979, um, they were only count counted within the Cyclopoida SPB category. There was no um, category for those species themselves. But in 1980, um, all the way to present, these species were counted within their own um, category. And if you were just looking at changes over time, you might suddenly see two new species appear. You might see an increase in um, diversity, which is actually just an artifact of the sampling methodology. So what our solution will do is it will, just as before, it'll just sum those two species level categories to the higher level Cyclopoida SPP category to prevent any artificial increase in diversity over time, although this will sacrifice taxonomic resolution as before. But what about invasive species like I mentioned? If a species really had just appeared in 1980, we wouldn't then want to remove them and sum them to a higher category. So our code um, will allow you to specify a buffer or a lag time after the invasion, um, after which you will permit the addition of species. So if you say there's a lag time of one year and say these two species had invaded in 1979, then these categories would be retained. And this solution can be optionally enabled um, in the various ways you can access this data set. So another um, issue that we encountered are differences in gear types. So we, in the data sets we um, combined, there were three different uh, types of gear used to target different taxa. So there was a macrozooplankton net used for amphipods and mycids, a mesozooplankton net used for copepods and cladocerans, and a microzooplankton net used for copepods and rotifers. And for the taxonomic resolution issues I described before, they're each resolved separately for each gear type, since each gear type targets a specific set of taxa. However, there are some taxa that are counted in both the micro and the meso nets. The meso net mesh is three times larger than the micro mesh, um, micro net mesh. So can we really expect taxa to be equally well sampled by both of these nets with such a large difference in mesh size? So what we did is we compared the environmental monitoring program uh, microzooplankton samples to the mesozooplankton samples from that same program and asked for each taxa were relatively more individuals caught in the micronet or the mesonet. Um, so this is what we found in this uh, complicated graph we have on the x-axis of each plot, we have the collection method, either meso in purple or micro in green. On the y-axis, we have the proportion of the total catch per unit effort represented in each um, collection method. And what you can see is that most taxa were caught much more abundantly in the micro net. So you can see in almost every case, the green bar on the right is much higher than the purple bar on the left. There are a few exceptions, the Cirripedia or barnacle larvae, cyclopoid adults, and the Oithona similis adults, where 
while also the cyclopoid juveniles were very close. And this is really helpful for us in the data integration uh, because we used these results to then add flags to the data for taxa that are undersampled in their representative gear type. Um, so for example, we would add a flag um, for Yuri Temera finis. We'd add a flag to the MISO sample saying that this taxa was probably undersampled by this gear type since it's clearly much better captured by the microzooplankton net. So the final integrated data set um, is impressively large. It includes over 2 billion estimated captured zooplankton that were caught in the nets used for these studies. Obviously not all 2 billion were counted since this subset is always counted. There are over 80,000 zooplankton samples, over almost five decades of data, 238 sampling stations. We have a lot of data on copepods, cladocerans, rotifers, mycids, amphipods, as well as data on many other critters. Um, and even after resolving the taxonomic resolution for a community analysis, which reduces that resolution, you're still left with 57 taxa and life stages. Um, so a pretty diverse data set. Um, on the right, I'm just showing a plot of the average CPUE over time um, for each year and just pointing out some of people's favorite uh, species from the survey. You can see Bosmina longarostris is on top in the pink, and then we have Pseudodioptimus adults in that purple and the Copepodites in the green. So um, hopefully you're all wondering how you can access the integrated data set by now. Um, there's three different ways. We have a data publication on the Environmental Data Initiative. The um, ID is edi.539. We also have a package for the R statistical programming language called Zuper with the amazing logo that Rosie designed. This is available on GitHub. And lastly, we have an interactive online Shiny application uh, which can be used to uh, create and filter the integrated data set as well as explore some interactive plots. And that's available on our shinyapps.io account uh, with the URL listed below. So lastly, I just want to thank um, especially the field and lab crews of the surveys that we um, have combined here. Obviously, we couldn't have done anything without the data being collected in the first place. So we are very thankful to everyone who's put in the hard work to collect these data, um, which we really can't appreciate enough. So that's all I had. I'd be happy to take any questions people might have um, if there's time for it. And we'll also be um, have that question and answer time a little bit later. Yeah, I think we have time for maybe one question. And uh, Wim has put one in the chat. Um, are the microzooplankton samples not first filtered with 150 micron mesh before analysis? So is it legit to add the catch per unit effort in the two sets of samples? Um, let's see, the microzooplankton samples. Yeah, so I think that's a good point. They are filtered through a mesh sieve um, before they are counted in the EMP program. Um, and we actually do have a note, which I should have mentioned, um, is that these results really only apply to the interpretation of EMP data and really shouldn't be extrapolated to other surveys um, because of that way that they process the data. So really what we are trying to do is ask um, in the final data sets you get from the EMP micro um, sampling versus the MISO data that we get from all five surveys, I'm using the EMP as an example, um, you know, how can you really compare these taxa across those two um, sampling methods? Great, well, uh, thank you, Sam. I think we should probably move on because we are still a little behind but um, we'll have time for more questions uh, in the discussion period in a little bit. 
Next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ted Sommer, who is the lead scientist from the Department of Water Resources and has made a career out of translating science into management relevant information. He's mostly a fish guy, but I think we'll forgive him. Um, and he's going to talk to us about how to um, make zooplankton data management relevant. So, Ted, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Yeah, thanks. Is it visible right now? Yes, but not the PowerPoint. I just see your team's chat. Okay. Good Perfect. Now. Yep. Okay, Thank great. You. Thanks. So it's one of the best studied estuaries on the planet. The Bay Delta has a really impressive history of research and scientific progress. And obviously, we're hearing a lot of that good work as part of this workshop on zooplankton. Much of that research forms the foundation of our understanding of the long-term changes in the Bay Delta and the watershed, and this continues to guide resource management. And while it's great we're using all this science for decision making, it's actually my experience that many scientists and policymakers have only a hazy understanding of what management tools are actually out there. The communication gap isn't surprising given how complex our geography and ecology and just the whole system is in general. We also don't really have any comprehensive reference documents that catalog our regional toolbox. And this lack of understanding of some of the practical management approaches makes it a whole lot less likely that the research we do is going to be designed to generate actionable science and that the policy we use is going to be comprehensive. So to try and address this communication gap, I just published um, the article shown here in our regional um, journal, San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science, and it summarizes our current toolbox that um, I've compiled for Bay Delta Natural Resources Management. The goal of my basic summary was to try and provide guidance for researchers who want to conduct uh, actionable scientists, actual science, excuse me, and to inform resource managers about the range of tools that we have available in the Bay Delta. And so I'm hoping many of you will take the time to read the original article. Um, I will only have time to go into some of the, the basics. For the purposes of, of my compilation, I, I chose to catalog management approaches into four different types of tools, regulatory, biological, infrastructure, and habitat. And so within each part of this conceptual model, uh, I've identified which approaches are widely used, which ones are still in kind of a feasibility or conceptual stage. And you can read the article that kind of breaks these different things down. I do have a few caveats in the article and what I'm going to go over today. Um, the focus of my, my talk is really about ecosystem management, not other natural resource issues such as water supply, or other infrastructure, or flood management, and so forth. Um, and then the other thing is that within each of these things, my coverage is really intended to be educational rather than some sort of endorsement of some particular approach versus another. In addition, although I cover each of these management approaches individually, Resource management problems in our system are typically addressed with a multifaceted approach. And so with all of those caveats uh, in mind, I'm gonna try and apply this conceptual model to the task at hand, how zooplankton data informs management. So we've got our pie down below. I'm gonna break out each of those and squish them down into some bar cookies. Um, so those are the same uh, pie components, um, listing the individual management tools that are really relevant to zooplankton. So I'm going to start first with the regulatory applications. 
So the regulatory approach is often the first step in implementing major changes in water or ecosystem management. Passing new laws and regulations are therefore a key tool that mandates agencies and private parties to implement actions to protect or improve management of some of our resources. So the three tools that I've included here relevant to zooplankton um, are, are the primary top-down approaches that we consider. I'm going to start first with species listings. Um, and this is one of the more obvious uses of zooplankton data for management. Um, as most everyone here is aware, many of the native species that we have in the Bay Delta have experienced long-term declines in abundance and distribution. And our local fish and wildlife agencies have the ability to increase protections for sensitive species through listings under the state and the Federal Endangered Species Act. The listing process here is really challenging. Uh, it requires lengthy reviews of species status, drivers of abundance, which includes things like plankton and food availability, and an overall assessment of extinction risk. And so zooplankton data really helps the agencies understand if and how food supply is a contributing threat. So some of the examples of the highest profile species uh, in the region um, include winter run, Chinook salmon, spring run, delta smelt, long fin, um, and steelhead trout. And a number of the mandates for these includes monitoring for zooplankton, as you heard from some of our previous other speakers. The predictions are relatively strong under EASA and require permits for activities that have the potential to harm species or their habitat, things like water diversions, discharge, construction, and other operations. So plankton data can also be really helpful to inform two other related categories of Bay Delta management, water quality permits and water rights permits. So one of the, the key drivers of Bay Delta management is our, our um, water rights permits under State Water Resources Control Board D1641. Uh, the table here kind of summarizes a lot of the key components. One of the things it does is it sets seasonal targets for the percentage of inflow that can be diverted by the big export facilities. Um, also, salinity is a big focus of water management. We have salinity targets at a number of compliance points along the axis of the estuary for water management, um, but also for drinking water and ecosystem management, which course, includes zooplankton. And salinity has also been uh, a focus of some of the biological opinions that I mentioned a moment ago. On top of that, there's numerous other uh, water quality issues in the Bay Delta that are subject to review um, by the regional water quality control boards. So the bottom line is that the regulators consider the status and trends of zooplankton in determining whether there are problems in the system and whether the regulatory actions are really effective. And as part of that, therefore, as you heard, um, a number of the zooplankton surveys are mandated um, by our permits. So moving on to infrastructure, California has one of the most heavily engineered water distribution systems on the planet. Uh, our infrastructure encompasses the various engineered components that are used to adjust uh, delta flow, inputs, outputs, distribution, and quality. These are the most frequently used tools that we have in the system with actions occurring basically on a daily basis. And there's at least two areas where zooplankton data can inform management, diversions and water treatment. I'm going to start first with um, water treatment. California has over 900 wastewater treatment plants that serve to reduce inputs of municipal and industrial contaminants in our waterways. In the Delta, the largest facilities we have are located in Sacramento and Stockton, but there are numerous other smaller facilities to service other Delta towns. At the same time, there are numerous challenges in water treatment in the Bay Delta, including aging infrastructure, rapid population growth, 
extreme weather events and emerging contaminants. And non-point sources of nutrients and contaminants are particularly challenging since they don't necessarily pass through our treatment plants. They're often mobilized through storm events when treatment may not be feasible. So for water treatment infrastructure, um, zooplankton data is critical for problem identification and for effectiveness monitoring. One of the highest profile examples of how lower trophic level data can be informative is the ECHO water project. This is an upgrade by regional SAN in Sacramento to help reduce nitrogen inputs to the Delta. And there's an image uh, in the left here. This upgrade to our local regional water treatment plant represents one of the major public works projects in Sacramento's history. And this project follows a similar upgrade to Stockton's wastewater treatment plant. And as a lot of you may be aware, trends in phytoplankton and zooplankton were primary considerations in requirements by the Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, to request these upgrades to the wastewater treatment plants. Moving on to water diversions. Um, I think uh, everyone here is likely aware that the Bay Delta provides the hub of the water distribution system for California. Two of the big diversions are the state and the federal water projects located in the South Delta. But in addition to that, we have some pretty large diversions in the Barker Slough area, Contra Costa County, and something like 2,000 smaller ag diversions uh, in the Delta. So as for wastewater treatment plants, zooplankton data are used for problem identification by the regulatory agencies and to identify whether water management is effective. So the bottom line is that the um, actual amount of, of water diversions is substantially each month. And for the, the water project, it's based on water demand, species management, water quality criteria, and tidal cycle. And zooplankton data is actually relevant to several of those areas. Moving on to our third area, habitat management. You heard a little bit about this from some of the previous speakers, but includes a broad area of actions to improve habitat quality or increase habitat area for target species. So the primary tools I considered relevant for zooplankton included uh, floodplain, tidal wetlands, and weed removal. Starting first with floodplain and riparian, you heard a little bit uh, about this from Jesse, but much of the historical riparian and floodplain in the Bay Delta has been lost due to a variety of activities, including levee construction, urban development, and agriculture. We do have some remnant habitat in Yola Bypass and Katsumnes River, and uh, research by our group and UC Davis has revealed the exceptional value of some of these areas. So here's an example of data collected um, in Sac River versus a Yolo bypass flood event for some of the different taxonomic groups. Um, and you can see there's a whole lot more um, zooplankton in Yolo bypass during flood events than in the Sacramento River. And we've also done studies on managed floodplain habitat where we've intentionally flooded areas. And the managed area is also included in a recent article we have on the same online journal where this article appears. So that research on uh, Yolo bypass and food webs um, really highlighted the excellent food resources we have um, on on channel, on off channel habitat in corresponding the strong response of fish, and that was really a key motivation for. Um, off-channel restoration in these, these areas. So for example, um, the 2009 National Marine Fisheries Service Biological Opinion calls for the creation of 8,300 hectares of seasonal floodplain habitat. Um, based on that, we've made good progress on fish habitat components to improve connectivity for migrating fish. The next big thing is the construction of a notch at the top of the floodplain to improve connectivity between the floodplain and the Sacramento River. And what that will do is improve connectivity to the seasonal habitat 
that can help to generate frequent high densities of zooplankton and other food resources. So like floodplain and riparian habitat, the vast majority of tidal wetland habitat in the Bay Delta has been lost due to development activities. And I hope a lot of you have seen it, but IEP did a great conceptual model and uh, publication on tidal wetlands. It provides a thorough review of some of the benefits of tidal wetlands to some of the at-risk fishes, among other things. And it, it, briefly, there are a lot of reasons why tidal wetlands should benefit the ecosystem, including increased food supply, refuge from predators, and habitat heterogeneity. So based on this recognition, there's been a pretty major effort to increase the amount of tidal wetland habitat to support delta smelt and other species. So as you heard from Dan, the current target in the most recent federal biological opinion in our state permit is over 3,200 hectares of tidal wetland habitat, and much of that habitat is concentrated in the North Delta system marsh. And as you heard, um, zooplankton monitoring is a key focus of the evaluation of these projects. One of the more extreme changes in the habitat category over the past decade um, in the Delta has been the proliferation of aquatic weeds. Um, so, for example, one of the recent publications highlighted here estimates that approximately one third of the open water habitat in the Delta has aquatic weed coverage. The high densities of weeds we see have a lot of effects on human activities, um, things like water management, recreation, but they can also affect habitat for listed species, presumably by impacting water quality, altering food supply, and providing refuge for some predators. There's a major effort, therefore, by uh, California Parks and Recreation to try and control aquatic weeds, uh, particularly by chemical means. A lot of this is um, emphasizing um, benefits for recreation, but there are potential benefits for aquatic species as well. So we're hoping a lot of you are also aware of a recent project by IEP to look at the localized effects of weed removal. And so in particular, does weed removal improve habitat for fish species of interest? And so the working hypothesis um, on the zooplankton end was that areas where there's no weeds, or at least where weeds are removed, would have improved zooplankton levels. Interestingly, in a recent report, uh, Nick Rasmussen and a whole team of folks did suggest that mm, not really so much. Actually, SAV often has a lot of zooplankton. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that species composition, size composition, but the, the thing I really want to emphasize is that these zooplankton data are very helpful for analyzing this particular management. Finally, I want to talk about um, some of the other biological areas where we actually do management activities. So, one of the more important examples that I covered in, in the conceptual model is uh, the growing importance of invasive species detection. The Bay Delta has an extreme invasion rate with growing problems for invasive plants, invertebrates, fish, and mammals. And one of the most cost-effective ways we have to try and deal with these species is really early detection. Um, and that helps us avoid successful introductions helps us also to do a rapid response. You're gonna hear about a variety of tools to try and detect uh, zooplankton and other invertebrates using visual surveys, remote sensing, um, eDNA over the course of, of this, this workshop. But I, I do wanna emphasize that in all of this, including some of the traditional surveys that you've heard about, are a critical first line of defense for I don't want to give the impression, though, that we have a lot of management options once the species are detected. Um, once species are established, management options are pretty limited. Habitat restoration may help in some cases, but it's, it's pretty tough. One of the other uh, common management 
approaches that we consider in the estuary here is hatchery supplementation. Um, this has been widely used to support salmonids in the Bay Delta. And zooplankton data that's collected in the system represent an important information source to help us understand how food resources can interact with some of those supplementation strategies. Salmon are really the only species right now that we're regularly supplementing into the Delta. But I want to note that it's likely that in the relatively near future, um, there's going to be some level of supplementation with Delta smelt in response to the requirements of a new biological opinion. In the meantime, uh, these species are being held in a refuge population in Byron, California. There's also a smaller backup population at Livingston Hatchery. So one of the more obvious uh, sources of information um, or applications of information for zooplankton data is to figure out what to feed these fish in the hatcheries. Um, so knowing what's in the environment is clearly an important issue. But less obvious is in considering um, field supplementation strategies. It may also be helpful to know which parts of the system are enriched in food. So this is one of our considerations in coming up with a supplementation strategy for Delta smelt in the future. So to summarize all this, um, the Bay Delta can be considered an estuary of superlatives. It's one of the more invaded estuaries in the world. It drains a high percentage of California. It provides um, water to something like 25 million people. It supports the world's fifth largest economy. And based on my review, I propose we add most heavily managed system as an additional remarkable system. My claim is based on the relatively long list of resource management tools. I only covered some of them today. And also the high frequency with which we use these tools. So there are a number of examples on the list we are managing on a daily basis in the system. But for zooplankton, I'm going to be honest and say that the data are not very useful for short-term decision making. We're not using them for daily or weekly management decisions. And zooplankton also are rarely the primary management focus for different applications. With all that said, uh, zooplankton data are clearly important. And one of the key reasons I wrote this article in general was to provide you all with guidance to try and um, help you conduct actionable science. So all of you wanting to maximize the management relevance of your research, please consider asking yourselves a simple question. If your project is successful, is there a way that your results could be used for management? So I've given you some examples here in the talk, but please consider this if you are, say, applying for the NICE Delta Science Program uh, PSP that you heard about earlier in the meeting. Um, we do rank proposals based on their management relevance. So this will hopefully help guide you on whether there's a management tool that might incorporate some of your work. I do want to fully acknowledge, though, that research has the capability to come up with totally new management tools that we have not thought of. As a consequence, understanding some of the current management options and their limitations will hopefully help um, fuel some of that innovation. Lastly, a related goal of my review is to try and better inform resource managers about the full suite of tools that are used in the Bay Delta. Managers are often faced with really complex problems that are difficult to address without understanding all of the options. This doesn't mean that there's easy answers to pretty much anything in the Bay Delta. Everything's hard. So figuring out which tools are going to be relevant is going to depend on multiple factors, including cost, political feasibility, socioeconomic concerns, resource availability, regulatory constraints, and the level of urgency. So having good zooplankton data is just one piece of a very large puzzle. And with that, uh, that concludes my talk. Happy to answer questions here, or we can roll it into the, the panel.
discussion. Thanks, Ted. That was really great. I think it's gotten a lot of uh, people talking in the chat. Um, I do think I would like to start the panel discussion. So invite all of the folks who um, talked in the lightning talks to come up to the virtual podium here um, and open up the questions to the entire group so that we can all talk about how to use this zooplankton data and make it relevant for managers. Um, and I guess to start things off, um, first of all, for those watching, feel free to put any questions in the chat or ideas or thoughts you want to contribute. Um, but I do have a couple Questions to start things off as the rest of the audience starts thinking about um, more questions for the panel. Uh, but for um, all you zooplankton collectors, plus Ted, um, how should we, uh, what can we do to make zooplankton data easier to use and get more people to use our zooplankton data to make management decisions? I think Ted is trying to answer the question, but he's yes. muted. Yes, so sorry. Uh, so I'll tackle the one of how to get more agencies and decision makers to use your information. Um, my pitch to all of you is you should become savvy about management options. So one of the questions is in the, in the chat is, oh, we should just ask the management agencies what they need. The management agencies do not typically know. I work with these people. Um, it really helps if you understand some of the management applications. So I'm hoping that more and more of you can become communicators to figure out how to use your zooplankton data to answer specific management questions. And then obviously it helps if the managers then become more savvy on zooplankton uses. But I'm, uh, for this conference, I'm going to put the onus on all of you to become more management savvy. Well, then, for the for the project PIs, um, what do you think about that? How uh, what do you need to do to um, become more management savvy, and how can you? Uh, get your data together with what um, managers might want to know. Uh, I see Steve has a question. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt uh, what you were asking if, if you want to follow that first, Rosie. Well, uh, none, so, of the, none of the panel had um, <laughs> raised their hands. So, Ted, so. I, I want to follow up. So um, uh, I'm interested in, in what you might say when trying to make zooplankton information more relevant to managers. Um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about the, the time frame of zooplankton dynamics and the time frame of management dynamics, and uh -huh. you know, I'm I'm wondering. Um, I, I guess I I consider those to be quite different time frames, and so uh, you know, are these are these essentially two ships passing in the night? Uh, is it enough to know to? I mean, you know, it's probably informative that people understand that you know zooplankton and food dynamics are linked to water management but as you mentioned you know how how governable is that management i, I guess i'll leave it there so um, i hope you got the idea that there's a long list of management tools and yes daily operations zooplankton data may not be that helpful but for evaluating a habitat restoration project uh, for improving wastewater treatment plants, deciding whether we need an upgrade. That's where um, the, the data has some value. So yeah, it, it's not useful for everything, but um, yeah, I, I still think um, we can have a lot of impact by 
figuring out better ways to summarize and present our data. I see Jesse has something to contribute. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that I, I'm probably not gonna be very helpful in answering the question about um, how to make, you know, ass assess whether manager, what managers needs are, but um, it is something that within our program, we um, are doing an internal review within our program. And it's a question that's come up is how um, is exactly this question. And we we still have yet to figure out a good answer for it, but it's something that we are exploring. And we've talked about things like surveys um, and, and we're not sure yet, but it's something that I think that programs probably should evaluate for themselves um, and, and come up with a plan for communicating their work to managers. Definitely. Arthur? Yeah, I'm obviously newer to the system and specifically agency work, but I found so far one of the biggest things that's helping me understand the management implications of, zo of my zooplankton data set specifically is getting involved with the management teams. So just being on the float maths team right now has really helped me try and figure out and think about ways that my data set can be used to show for us specifically for that, for the float mass project, how flow alteration and flow action can impact the abundance of different uh, Delta smelt prey items. So I think being involved in management groups um, is really going to help you get your data set um, more management applicable. Yeah, definitely. There's and a lot of the IEP project work teams and um, some of the even more management heavy groups like um, Camped, uh, definitely good places to highlight those products. Sam? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think everyone has made good points. I'll just um, one other point I think is the importance of the metric that you use. So we've had a lot of interest in the chat on biomass um, and biomass conversions. And I think that is a, a, another really important way to make these data more relevant is that, you know, in some cases it's really the biomass that people are most interested in, in terms of uh, the fish food that they may be providing. Um, and that's still a major hurdle that we're encountering where, um, you know, those, the data that we need to create these biomass metrics um, are, you know, some of the least available data or the data is still really being tidied and fixed in QAQC at this moment, um, as well as the conversion that we need to convert them um, are spotty. Uh, so we don't have full conversions for all of the taxa in the system in many cases we're using estimates from related species, which are uh, really not ideal. So I think that's a major gap that could help improve the management relevance of these data. Yeah, and that's something that I've been in so many conversations about. Do you have good biomass conversions? We've got some that like, you know, for the, the major critters that everyone uses, but then if, when we get into things like insects and amphipods and, conversions are spotty and you know we use something that's in the same family that was in some paper depends on what it's preserved in and yeah it gets really complicated so just putting it out there if anyone's interested in applying for um that delta science grant still plankton biomass not exactly sexy but would be really useful <laughs> um let's see i saw some hands up from the group, um, I think, sorry, there's uh, it looks uh, like they over 100 out. people, and now I can't figure out whose hand is raised. I think it's Sean, <laughs> and yeah, it looks like Sean. it's the top one. Excellent. Sean, you have something to add? Yeah. Well, I think you kind of know what I'm going to ask, but I've asked this to you and others before is that under a number of these different organizations on the, at the management level and the scientific integration where we sort of uh, bridge these two points, um, there is a significant need for understanding how those actions will affect zooplankton. What is the zooplankton response to those actions? So modeling 
has been suggested as a way of doing it. But routinely, I've seen mostly just conceptual models. And um, there have been some more complex models. Wim has his box model. And um, the scales are pretty large. Some of the actions are pretty small. So what can we, uh, is the zooplankton data, uh, I mean, in a broad sense, is it, can we use it for these more simplistic, smaller scale models uh, for these individual management actions, such as the North Delta Foo Web? And uh, as far as I know, there's, there's one being developed now. What about for other actions that can be done, such as um, habitat breaches and other things like that? Yeah, so modeling, I mean, I'll go ahead and start with uh, my thoughts on that is that models are only as good as the data you put into it. And zooplankton, even more so than fish, are really spotty and hard to get a handle on. So I think we haven't developed good models of zooplankton because there hasn't been good enough data to parameterize them with yet. But it may be that some of the really targeted monitoring we're doing on some of these small flow actions will allow us to make models in the future. Don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that. Wim, um, you're on mute. Yeah, on that on that topic, I think we have heaps of data, really way more than we need on abundance of zooplankton in the main channels um, at certain times and at certain levels of resolution. But for doing things like the box model that, that uh, Sean, Sean alluded to, we actually need count data of individual life stages um, at um, and very large counts, counts in the tens to hundreds per stage to make uh, to make good models of uh, movements and uh, and survival of mortality. So um, so to do that, you really have to mount a very detailed study, and it can't really be done with monitoring data, at least not the kinds of monitoring data we're talking about. Okay. So I'm, I'm getting the sense that uh, my question, the, the answer to that question is no. The data is not sufficient for doing simplistic models. Um, my concern is that uh, most of the actions that we are looking at and some of the stuff for structured decision making for delta smelt, not necessarily salmon actions, but for the delta smelt actions, are food related. Our predictions are conceptual and if we want to compare alternatives between those actions, we can't do it without a quantitative method to do so. Otherwise, well, we're just based on the conceptual understanding. That we got to start somewhere and we're going to try yeah. it out and see what happens. And that's what adaptive management is all about. You can't always model everything. Sometimes you have to uh, run an experiment. So, yeah, but we'll see. my understanding of adaptive management is that you even start with something that you may uh, find to be too uncertain a result to rely on, but you at least have to have something to compare alternatives we've, to. We've got a conceptual model and we'll see what happens. But that's not quantitative. No, it's not. I see Anitra has a question. Um, earlier, I was I was wondering about um, just the, the the thought that zooplankton data isn't that useful to managers. I was thinking of the pelagic organism decline and the fact that that was noted. You know, we sort of started out with some earlier scorecards and started seeing it, and then IEP they were seeing it, and it became a big issue, right? And so, I think that I think that zooplankton data is useful. Um, and of course, I think most people would agree that with that. But the thing is, is that it's I don't think we spend enough time talking about it like we do fish. Fish are sexier. And but I do think fish are extremely variable, too. So being as a past plankton ecologist, I think that 
um, we do study the system pretty well, and I think we've learned a lot in the past from by looking at zooplankton data. So I just want to make sure that we don't feel like everything has to be studied to such an extreme extent that we can't make suppositions with the data that we have. So that was just the thought that I had. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, did anyone else want to weigh in or I'll talk about how much I love zooplankton data? And and I guess the other um, thing Michelle, I was going to say, or, oh, I was gonna Go say is that, yeah, never mind. <laughs> Trishelle, did you want to add to that? Oh, yeah. No, sorry. To, I was just going to um, agree with that sentiment. I think one of the really exciting things about what's happening now is more people are talking about the data, and it's really exciting to see this data integrated, and we're going to get more eyes on it, and I think that's going to really open up a lot of management possibilities that we maybe haven't explored before. Because I feel like not enough people get in a room and talk about this stuff like they do with fish. So I think that's really exciting of where we're going in the future. Definitely. And I don't want anyone to feel like the message here is zooplankton isn't useful for management. I think, you know, there is the point that it takes a little longer to get the data. So it's not as useful for um, real time operations. But like Ted said, it's very useful for evaluating restoration sites or, you know, um, I'm working on the North Delta Food Web Action and the Salinity Control Gates Adaptive Management, which on an annual basis, you know, we'll see whether a uh, action was successful or not. It just, you know, it'll take six months or so before we can make that call. And, but then we can use it for the following year. Um, and also, I think Trishel's definitely right that just having the data integrated and visualized in a really useful way um, will help more people use it because I think zooplankton data can be intimidating for people who aren't zooplankton experts. Uh, Christina? Um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what everybody was saying and I think that um, the efforts that we as the zooplankton synthesis group have been doing um, has added to people kind of realizing what zooplankton data is out there and just educating people a little bit more. And I think that um, maybe some of the gaps that were before is that, you know, people knew that zooplankton data was being collected, but not maybe really to the extent and what they can do with it. And so I think, you know, like Trishelle said, integrating the data and having that out there and symposiums like this and the different talks that Sam has been making the circles around. I think that just getting that information out there that we do have this data to look at, I think that has helped a lot and will help a lot in the future. Excellent, yes. We're gonna take one more question from Jenlin, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and then we'll probably go to a break. Hi, I just want to say, uh, make one comment. I, I really, really appreciate the effort that's happening um, at the, the Delta Stewardship Council, and I really feel excited about where this is going. Um, I think I want to just make one comment about the, the data. We, we know that we do not have enough zooplankton data. However, when we do a conceptual model or a biogeochemical model for the system, we have a lot of data sets that's isolated but also connected at the same time. For instance, if you do a uh, a lower food web model and you, in addition to the zooplankton data, you also have phytoplankton data and your nutrient data. And I feel like all these data provide additional validation to your model. And if we, even if we don't have enough data of zooplankton, if we can um, come up with a coherent story and uh, with the data sets and your model matching with like multiple different types of data set, I think um, that would be a very um, a great way um, in my mind to use the data as well. Um, so. Definitely integrating not just zooplankton, but the phytoplankton and the nutrients. Sam, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I was just going to agree that's a really great point and that these zooplankton data sets don't exist in isolation. Like many people have mentioned, a number of them are collected alongside fish abundance data as well as a lot of environmental data. Uh, which is really valuable. And there are a number of other long-term 
surveys like the phytoplankton or benthic survey that um, could be really importantly paired with the zooplankton data. And also, you know, SAM's integrated data set, awesome though it is, it's not all the zooplankton data that's out there. And we concentrated on the major long-term programs, but there's a lot of special studies, you know, um, smaller efforts that I think would be really valuable to kind of have this be the starting point that we can add to and um, make it easy for people to you know, contribute their own zooplankton data, even if it is spatially or temporally a lot more limited than the long-term surveys to yeah, build this out to look at some of these more integrated models. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I, as I was talking, I like glanced at the clock. I'm like, oh shoot, it's time to go for a break. Um, it was, I'm just having too much fun. But uh, please feel free to continue um, putting questions in the chat and we'll get to them as we get to them. And um, want to come back at, is 3.50 good, Sam? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's take about a nine minute break to start off at 3.50. All right. Thanks, Thank Rosie. you guys. Bye-bye. Sam, I don't know if you can hear me. Sam, can you hear me? We can hear you. Sam might have stepped away for a minute. I see. Um, I think I am the next speaker at 350. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure my the share the screen button is not activated. So I was going to use my computer for the slides. Uh, so let me check. I'll make sure you've moved over. Yeah, to it says present. only meeting organizers and presenters can share. I think I'm a participant right now. Gotcha. I'll move you over really quick. Thank you.
Manu, would you like to try sharing your screen um, in the two minutes we have before we get started, just to make sure it would work? Perfect. Looks great. Thank you. All right, so it's 3.50 and I'm going to give it a few more seconds to make sure everyone has a minute to get back to us here to, before we get started for session three. Okay, so Sam, we ready to go? Yeah, go for it. Awesome. All right. So welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking it out. Um, my name is Cheryl Patel. I'm a California Sea Grant State Fellow working with the Delta Science Program. And I'm going to get us through uh, session three, which will be focusing on emerging technologies in the future. And we have three great talks lined up right now. And without you know further ado, I'm just going to introduce Dr. Manu Prakash, who is an associate professor at the Department of Bio Bioengineering at Stanford University. And he has a really great talk um, about a modular low cost microscopy tool. So please go ahead, Dr. Prakash. So thank you for having me. Uh, it's uh, absolutely a pleasure to connect with this uh, broader ecological community. I've lived in the Bay Area for a long while and uh, had not seen the extent of work that has happened uh, over the history of uh, um, today what i want to do is i'll specifically focus on a low cost uh, imaging slash microscopy tool that we've been working uh, for community scale monitoring but i want to put it in a broader context of what i often call frugal science so I love a lab, uh, run a lab at Stanford uh, with the primary goal where we try to build and design scientific instruments, uh, but with a very cost uh, effective framework in mind. Uh, the lab is very diverse, uh, and I think uh, over here and there, I'll also sprinkle certain other projects that many of you who might care also about the fundamental biology of uh, zooplankton, both in uh, different kinds of aquatic environment might actually enjoy. Uh, so the premise of uh, frugal science, from my perspective, is thinking about cost and performance uh, together. Uh, and often enough, when we're thinking about scale up, especially planetary scale measurements, we really have to be thinking about how do you make uh, scientific instruments much more broadly accessible and uh, often democratize this access. Uh, we do this in the context of health. Uh, we do this. Uh, this is one of our field sites uh, in Madagascar, for example. We do this in the context of education, uh, where environmental monitoring and education to me are the two sides of the same coin. Uh, and we, of course, do this in the context of biodiversity mapping. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that I want to leave you with uh, at the which if I don't get to I want to state it early on is unless we make the process of science accessible to a broader group of people around the world, uh, we might find ourselves in a situation where from a societal context uh, there is a big gap between understanding and of course much of environmental and ecological monitoring is about transitioning into action. Uh, but often enough, most people and common citizens around the world have absolutely no context because they've never had that experience. 
Uh, and again, this is true around the world. So how do you make tools to make planetary scale measurements? I was hearing in the previous sets of talks of how do you increase orders of magnitude, our capacity to do surveillance in aquatic systems. I'll primarily first focus on the ocean, but much of this uh, is applicable to much broader uh, context. And the background and kind of a historic note here is, uh, I don't know if many of you can identify this object to the right, that's Sputnik, uh, but many of you might not know that uh, when Sputnik was launched, we had no technologies to map the skies. There were no automated sampling tools and technologies to map satellites. And Fred Whipple, a famous astronomer at that time, started Operation Moonwatch, which was the world's largest and the longest citizen science program by giving telescopes to tens of thousands of people around the world and teaching and training them how to collect scientific data. I've uh, often enjoyed this historic context and realized uh, it has roots, deep roots in why amateur astronomy is so strong around the world that the only observed supernova has been observed by uh, amateur citizens. So how do we do that for health and how do we do that for environment? Uh, and often enough, when we think about these challenges, I often think of the community health workers, for example, and many of the environmental monitoring stations are citizen science programs because a broader group of people can engage in data collection. I'll share a few examples of this, but now primarily focus on one aquatic tool. Uh, so we work on many of these tools uh, and most of this is published so you can find out about these tools. But let's dive in into microscopy. Uh, I'm sure many of you recognize this uh, famous man and also uh, what he's doing. Uh, this is Mahatma Gandhi looking through a microscope. I enjoy this image because it reminds us of, uh, you know, the context of uh, who should microscopy be accessible to. And we started thinking about this for the last 10 years and we have unveiled a large number of tools in the context of microscopy all the way from starting with Foldscope that you can use to uh, image zooplankton and taxonomically identify them in the field, but they cost literally $1.75 to build. Uh, it's an origami microscope. Uh, there's a lot written uh, and a lot is known about Foldscope because now it's commercially available. I'll focus on uh, another tool that we have just released, uh, which is probably where Sam uh, read this paper. We call it plankton scope, uh, but you can go to foldscope.com and find a lot about uh, the, the $1 instrument. Now, plankton scope cost us roughly around $100, uh, and I'll actually focus on why we built that. And one of the reasons we built that is this ship. Uh, when I started thinking about oceanography, I started realizing how expensive it is to be on research vessels and how expensive it is the conventional programs that are run. And the flip side of it was there were citizens around the world, uh, sailors, for example, uh, that recreationally sail. And it occurred to us uh, as a team, uh, this is a large team, uh, we started an organization called Plankton Planet to essentially output sailboats uh, to be able to do uh, uh, temporal and spatial resolution mapping of species around uh, the oceans first. Uh, that led to a program, I often jokingly call it a citizen science. Uh, these were the first sets of 15 sailors we recruited. The first version of the program was focused on genomics and sequencing uh, that ran for uh, two years. Uh, and one of the factors there was what well, we were able to establish using this type of a framework that we could do the kind of sampling that many research vessels do uh, from a quality, but on the other hand, we were able to do this in a distributed manner at a fraction of the cost. Uh, and that led to thinking about how we might uh, start asking ourselves uh, to do this more broadly. And we brought in microscopy to the equation uh, from that perspective. So most often when I think about these programs, I'm thinking about scientists, makers, and mariners uh, all together. Uh, and we will focus on imaging. So let me just show you one of the tools that we built. Uh, I will skip this to get to the tool itself. Uh, we call this tool plankton scope. Uh, it's a completely modular instrument. So many of you who have used flow cams and other tools like that, you probably would uh, uh, compare it to that as a tool, uh, but it's doing automated imaging. 
Uh, there are different modules that you put together. Uh, of course, the strength of this program and project is this only cost around 100 to 150 dollars to build as compared to uh, similar tools that would cost roughly between 50 to 100 thousand uh, dollars. And of course, all our work is open source, so any of you could actually build it. Um, from a quantitative perspective, uh, from a microscopy side of the story, you can roughly do around uh, you know, a micron, uh, depending on the type of optics that you get to choose. Uh, and from a framework perspective, uh, what we do is computationally image uh, anything that you would put in it, it segments it, and then uh, we use Ecotaxa as a framework for uh, classification side of the story. Uh, this is the kind of data that would come out of this instrument if you built it. Uh, this is actually a uh, uh, bioluminescent uh, bloom uh, recorded, and of course, uh, this is at a much higher frame rate. I'm just playing this out. Uh, this is the bandwidth at which uh, the microscope is collecting data. So within a period of five uh, to 20 minutes, you would have around 20 to 30,000 objects, uh, and hence it makes a fairly challenging computational pipeline. We have compared and benchmarked this tool with, say, for example, FlowCam, and uh, it meets, you know, by standard of the eye and very quantitative standards, the same sets of uh, resolution metrics, uh, but except uh, it's open source uh, and anybody in the community can build it. We've been working on building a larger community of users around the world that have started mapping uh, ecosystems and ecological contexts that people often find themselves in, all the way from, uh, you know, this is a community of traditional fishing communities in Chilica in India, uh, in Lake Chilica. Uh, and this is uh, on the side of uh, after 20 minutes of that data collection, this would be one way that you would visualize the data. Of course, you get the data organized in many different contexts uh, and uh, both in terms of abundance and in terms of size metrics. There are certain sets of computational things that we can compute on top of it. Uh, and currently the Ecotaxa team has been working very hard on machine learning tools associated with this as well. Uh, this is the current number of plankton scopes around the world uh, and that community is starting to grow. And the reason I am extremely excited about sharing this with all of you is hopefully to strengthen the community locally and especially learn from the expertise that we have in making this tool far more robust uh, that citizens around the world could actually help and engage in ecological mapping. Uh, you know, all the way from to the left is a group of high school students in France uh, imaging and using these tools. Uh, all what I said is available on this website. You can go to planktonscope.org. Uh, and much of what I said about the organizational side of this work is documented on planktonplanet.org. Uh, so you can find uh, a lot about this uh, online as well. Uh, and what I want to mention is just very briefly mention two more things uh, associated with this and take some time for questions. Uh, in tool building, one of the things that we discovered along the way was also starting to ask uh, fundamental questions in biology associated with uh, zooplankton and plankton in general. Uh, and what we found was that there was a challenge in trying to understand the innate behavior of zooplankton, uh, especially from a vertical migration context. So we invented a new tool. It's called Gravity Machine. Uh, this is also something that you can look at. It's on gravitymachine.org. And I'm just going to show one or two data sets associated with this. Uh, what Gravity Machine is, is our answer to be thinking about uh, how do you handle organisms that travel vertically, maybe even say a kilometer? but you would like to image them at the subcellular resolution. Uh, and this is has been a challenge for the last, you know, if you think about the last 200 years of microscopy, because we've been doing microscopy on the XY plane. And what we thought about is what if you do microscopy in the vertical axis, and that led to this configuration, uh, which is essentially uh, what we call a gravity machine. Uh, and the simplest way to understand this uh, is imagine a microscope uh, which essentially has an infinite vertical column. 
So, you know, if you had an infinitely long space, uh, you could essentially image uh, along the way. Uh, but, you know, most of us don't live on skyscrapers. Uh, and we asked ourselves a question, how could you do that uh, in the context of finite space? Uh, and so essentially we built a treadmill, treadmilled for microorganisms. Uh, and now if a zooplankton is trying to climb up vertically, we spin the wheel down. And if it's trying to climb down, we spin the wheel up. So in the lab frame of reference, the organism that you're studying is stationary, but in its own frame of reference, it's actually doing the work. Now we can do this in a virtual reality context where we could add information, including the ecological information, temperature, light, pressure, and hence start to study innate behavior of many organisms in an aquatic context. Uh, so I will just show you one video from uh, what type of videos, data sets that come out of a tool like this. Uh, so this, for example, is a bat star larva. And in your frame of reference, it looks as if it's just levitating right in front of you. Uh, but this is actually freely swimming tens of meters vertically. And what we are doing is we are tracking this in X, Y, and Z to be able to collect a data set like this. And if you go to the website that I mentioned, gravitymachine.org, so just from a physical context, this is what the tool actually looks like. You can see this ring. Uh, this is the instrument. Uh, we've been able to take this instrument uh, to the field, uh, especially field stations and also to research vessels. Uh, and the kind of data that you'll be able to find on the website that I just mentioned uh, is in uh, here. If you go to gravitymachine.org, you can explore these data sets. And especially what's interesting about this is the multi-scale data sets. So if I was to zoom in, you can see this is the actual trajectory that the organism took. The vertical column here could be five meters, but you have microscopic observation of what the organism was doing all the way to single. Uh, so this is why uh, this is a very exciting instrument, and we've been able to discover uh, some very interesting biology on these organisms, uh, both in uh, aquatic ecosystems and uh, you know lab references, but also uh, in uh, research vessels as well. Uh, and then finally, I just want to say one word about uh, Foldscope, which is broadening out access even further to be thinking about what does it mean for all of us to carry microscopes in our pocket. So uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, we started on this journey of uh, building a microscope that would only cost a dollar, but that could allow you to do 700 nanometer resolution imaging. Uh, we played with some uh, optical tricks to be able to actually build something. So this data set that you are watching, for example, is collected on a microscope that costs a dollar out in the field. Um, and we started sharing this tool and something fascinating happened, which is a, a testament in terms of thinking about community driven work. Um, we started building these tools and sharing them with communities around the world and we started seeing ownership of communities taking this tool in directions that they cared about. Uh, that has now led to the world's largest microscopy community. There is roughly around 1.3 million fold scopes that have been deployed so far. Uh, there is a very large database, roughly around 400 or so papers. So if you would like to see what data is collected on this, uh, you can go to microcosmos.foldscope.com. Uh, and I think I want to leave with the message Sometimes as scientists, I mean, this is just my own personal work that I felt that we as scientists, uh, of course, are thinking about questions and developing tools, but many a times the tools that we use, if they were more broadly accessible to people around the world, they would bring applications that we might never imagine. So this, for example, is a farming community in one of the tribal areas in Chhattisgarh in India that's using Foldscope to identify uh, Fusariums uh, and agriculture pests. Uh, uh, you know, this is veterinary scientists uh, in national parks identifying parasites in elephants. Uh, this is actually a full scope club in Iraq, uh, right when the war ended in the war zone. Uh, and I think, you know, in the end, we have to grapple with this question that unless we make science accessible to people, everyday people will not be able to define their own role in science. 
So I think I'm often left with this image thinking about, uh, and this is what drives me in thinking about why we should share our work and share the tools uh, openly is because the next generation that comes along has far better ideas than many of us might imagine, and it's extremely important for us to engage, especially in the context of the crisis situation environmentally that we find ourselves in. So with that note, I will end and I can take uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. That was a fantastic talk, and I think we have time for one question if anyone wants to either chime in or put it into the chat, but I encourage you to continue um, the conversation with Dr. Prakash in the chat um, after this one question. So I know everyone's really excited about the foldoscope and you're mm -hmm. probably going to see them under the Christmas trees this year. Yeah, and I think one thing that would be valuable in that perspective is uh, we have a rule we call a foldscope club like the fight club. Uh, is that if you ever share a full scope with an individual, then you have to give it to them. And, uh, you know, often enough when you're thinking about it, think about one individual that you could bring into the microscopic world if without your effort, uh, that person would have never seen a microscopic image for real. So I think, yeah, it's it would be phenomenal for all of you to engage. Um, I think, Sam, did you have a question? Yeah, um, that was an amazing talk. Uh, I just had a really quick and specific question. I was wondering for the plankton scope, what is the largest size of an organism that could be captured by the camera? You showed a lot of really small things. Um, I was just wondering how large. Yeah, I think much of that data sets I had cropped actually. So <laughs> one of the beauty of this, because it's modular, uh, we get to choose on the optics. So if you have a range in mind, often enough we would have a field of view all the way to around, I would say three millimeters. It's very doable. Uh, okay. Post that, some of the lenses become a little more expensive, but one of the threads is it's completely modular. So you snap in and out the lenses. Uh, and this, the challenge there is not on the field of view, uh, but a little bit on the filtration strategy. So we apply certain filters before and after to not completely clog uh, your, so all you have to do is just make sure you dilute your samples mm -hmm. because it's in a flow chamber and there's yeah. a certain depth of field associated with the device, but all of that is completely modular. We have a technique that we've developed that just using exacto knife and tape, you can build these flow chambers so they could be disposed after one use so you don't have to clean them. And all of that is documented also on the community site. Uh, if you go to plankton.org and then you can join the Slack channel as well. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash. That was again a really interesting talk. Um, again, I encourage a conversation in the chat while we move on to our next speaker. Um, I want to invite Dr. John Ryan, who is a biological oceanographer from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and he will be talking to us about uh, sampling zooplankton using a, a autonomous underwater vehicles. So take it away, Dr. Ryan. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Prakash, that was amazing. <laughs> really beautiful work, thank you. So I'm John Ryan, I'm a biological oceanographer working uh, in the Monterey Bay region. I'm at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is right along the central coast of Monterey Bay. And my co-authors are Julio Harvey, a molecular biologist, and Yan Wu Zhang, an engineer. Um, we have worked with a number of people who I'll acknowledge along the way, but um, uh, most of the work that I'll present was actually part of a project called Sampling and Identification of Marine Zooplankton, SIMS, that Julio Harvey led while he was at Ambari. He's now at UC Santa Cruz. I'll start with this image from NASA um, because it really gets exactly at why we're focused on targeted sampling. It's an image of the California current large marine ecosystem with the biological structure of the coastal ocean being emphasized. And 
um, you know, we can see immediately the uh, dynamic, productive, heterogeneous environment that we are attempting to understand. And if we zoom in on Monterey Bay with observations from satellite on the left, about one kilometer resolution, and aircraft on the right, about 17 meter resolution, uh, we can begin to see some of the um, fine scale structure that develops in these coastal habitats. And of course, what we're looking at is ocean color as influenced by uh, phytoplankton, uh, microscopic algae. And this image on the right uses the near infrared band instead of red to emphasize a certain type of bloom, um, sometimes called a red tide. And um, so when we enter this environment, we can study it in a number of ways. We can take time series observations at one location, and that's a very effective way to understand many phenomena and many time scales of variation. However, what this work uh, is focused on is something different. It's about entering that complex environment and letting the conditions you encounter uh, in the moment be recognized and responded to by an autonomous vehicle. So what is the vehicle that we're going to focus on today? Um, oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> I also wanted to just take a moment and place zooplankton in the web of life and emphasize that, you know, when I've studied zooplankton with colleagues, I'm always also looking uh, in both directions through the, the trophic web, uh, downward to phytoplankton, upon which the zooplankton rely, and upward to animals like whale sharks, which rely on zooplankton. Largest of, of fish on Earth eats zooplankton. And in one of our studies tracking uh, whale sharks in the eastern tropical Pacific, we learned through satellite tracking of the animals, satellite observations of the environment, that they were behaving in a sense, like plankton, that is to say they were occupying habitat where we know physics and chemistry drive high uh, biological productivity that the whale sharks rely on for food. And so now the vehicle that I'm going to focus on today is called Dorado. Um, we have a number of people at Ambari who operate it and develop the gulper water sampler. Uh, for example, this is the water sampler section in, in the, the middle. And what these gulpers do is after the vehicle has placed sampling cap capabilities right where you want them, it will rapidly take in a liter and a half of water. And the idea there is that zooplankton don't have much time to escape if they're going from outside the vehicle to inside the container that quickly. And the nose section is packed full of physical, chemical, and optical sensing so that the for two reasons. Number one, it allows us to understand the complex ecosystem. And number two, it allows the vehicle to use onboard real-time measurements of the environment to make decisions. And I wanna highlight my co-authors here. Julio was taking the photo, so I've gotta place him here. Yan Wu is, is right here. Um, this is the late, great Bill Peterson. Uh, and Bob Reinhook, we did most of this work uh, as part of Bob's lab. And um, look, what you're looking at here is Monterey Bay through a different lens. This is synthetic aperture radar imagery, which represents ocean surface roughness. Uh, and wherever you see a relatively bright sea surface, the ocean's relatively rough due to wind, for example. And wherever you see a dark ocean surface, for example, right here, uh, the ocean is very smooth. It's a slick. And this slick that you see consistently oriented from northwest to southeast across northern Monterey Bay is a feature that we're going to focus on in this. Um, it is the frontal boundary or the region of strong gradients between the offshore region affected by coastal upwelling that uh, originates north of the bay and flows south across the mouth of the bay and the, the warmer more stratified, more biologically productive waters inside the bay, referred to as the upwelling shadow. And ideally, we want uh, autonomous vehicles to be able to recognize not just the different water masses, 
across this region, but the biological patches within different environments. So I'm gonna describe three ways that we've applied the AUV. The first is simply geographically targeted sampling. So without the use of a ship, the vehicle started off Moss Landing, uh, it swam, uh, doing a vertical yo-yo profile throughout, basically cutting a slice through the ocean up to the northern bay, then across the mouth of the bay and back to Moss Landing. And if we stretch out this whole transect, that's what you see here from zero to a, more than 80 kilometers in length. And I'll just point out a few of the major features that this vehicle crossed. It crossed, um, it went from relatively warm into relatively cold waters and back again. The cold waters were rich in nutrients, that's from coastal upwelling, and they were impoverished of the optical signature of phytoplankton because they've just come from deep and they don't have a lot of phytoplankton in them. But what I want you to notice is this top row, which represents the abundance of uh, larvae and copepods quantified from samples taken by the vehicle. And at geographic points, we happen to sample at, um, here, let me move this. Whoops. Hey, hey. Um, sorry about that. Um, we happen to sample at these boundaries between warm and cold water, the frontal regions, which are known to be um, biologically productive and to aggregate biological activity across trophic levels. And in this case, we're seeing the highest uh, zooplankton activity uh, abundance at the front. The next style or approach to sampling is optically targeted sampling. That is using an optical sensor on board the AUV and letting the AUV itself decide when it's going to sample. And in this, this study, we placed an AUV survey consistently within the biologically rich upwelling shadow, the relatively warmer water, and one of the transects in particular, this southeast transect cut across the, the frontal gradients of that uh, upwelling shadow. So let's take a look at that slice going from offshore to onshore across the front. Um, as viewed from an aircraft, actually an airship, what you can see here is that the ocean surface was quite heterogeneous. We had narrow foam lines, red water next to green water, and this signature is an indication of interaction between physics, convergence, waters flowing horizontally together, converging, and upward swimming by microscopic algae, in this case, that colored the water red. But this is the very same interaction that can concentrate zooplankton that swim. And so often when we're studying zooplankton, we're, we can get important ecological information from the distributions of phytoplankton. So now let's slice across this region with the AUV. And uh, this vertical section is going from offshore to onshore. This track shows how the AUV um, sampled properties in the water column and these gray dots near the bottom are where the AUV itself decided to take samples. Now, if I was looking for phytoplankton rich water or zooplankton rich water, I wouldn't necessarily look on the bottom, but what the AUV found was, um, and within the, um, the entire water column, the highest chlorophyll concentrations were actually on the bottom, as well as the highest concentrations of particles from another sent measured by another sensor. Now the phytoplankton would normally be up at the surface, but what was happening is frontal physics, the convergence of water in the frontal zone was so strong that the downwelling flows carried the phytoplankton and the zooplankton to the bottom. Now let's uh, add another dimension to what the AUV can do in real time. It can use hydrographic data that defines the water types as well as optical data. So here in this survey, the AUV started offshore and uh, swam across this cold upwelling filament that originated north of the bay, and it swam into the warmer waters of the upwelling shadow. Now the AUV was told to allocate its sampling capabilities, three offshore in the cold water, four in the frontal zone, and three within this upwelling shadow. 
And so here's that temperature slice from the upper 42 meters or so from offshore to onshore. Three samples were allocated offshore, four in the front, and three more within the upwelling shadow itself. And here in optical data, we could also see how the front had the highest chlorophyll concentrations, highest particle backscattering, and the highest particle volume as measured by this instrument called Listolo, made by Sequoia Scientific. And then last, uh, lastly, you know, we want AUVs not just to go out once, but to stay out and track these fronts because they're often where the action is, where we care about processes that drive larval transport, recruitment, settlement. And so this time series of satellite images show how, shows how this frontal zone was moving uh, during a period, June 8th to June 11th, as wind forcing changed ocean circulation. And a different type of AUV, a long range AUV, uh, developed by Jim Bellingham, um, as well as Brett Hobson and others at Ambari, uh, that, that vehicle was programmed to recognize the front and to follow it. So what you're looking at here is a series of vertical sections made by that AUV over four days. And the black vertical line in each vertical section shows you the position of the front, which was not just a physical boundary, warmer inshore, colder offshore, also a biological boundary, more chlorophyll rich inshore, more chlorophyll poor offshore. And even though the front moved 10 kilometers offshore, the AV autonomously tracked it without a single instruction from us. And then the last thing I want to touch on, these images do not compare to those of Dr. Prakash. I want his instrument on our vehicle. <laughs> um, but this is, we tried the Sequoia Scientific List Holo on our vehicle because we wanted to get image data at the same scale that we get physical measurements of the water, chemical measurements and optical measurements. And what we found is that this sensor could give us a good sense of the diversity of plankton out there, but we did a, a, a very important test. We compared the diversity and abundance that we saw through the scope with the diversity and abundance we captured by our gulper samples that we don't think let any plankton escape. And what we learned is that the way we were deploying this imaging instrument was not effective for capturing diversity and abundance. Here's why. Uh, the vehicle is moving through the water column rapidly, pushing a bow wave ahead of it. So any plankton that are sensitive to pressure and able to scoot away will move right out of the way and are sipping uh, to bring water slowly past the lens of the imager is not going to be effective at getting a representative sample. So I just wanted to put that out there that ultimately we need to combine imaging with vehicle behavior. Have that vehicle find a feature of interest, park in it, and look at it for a long time so it can see the diversity within the community. And then this is my last uh, slide. I just want to emphasize that these AUVs are getting more and more capable. This is from a, a paper Jan Wu led recently. It's in a different environment, but in fact, we developed the capabilities right here in coastal California. And it's basically, um, it involves the long range AUV, which can be out for weeks at a time. So you can send it off to do a mission even offshore and unattended interact with it through satellite. And there's a communications gateway provided by a wave glider and acoustic subsurface communication so that they can track each other. Uh, Brett Hobson, Yan Wu, and others are developing amazing capabilities for these vehicle fleets. And uh, then Chris Sholin at Ambari and Jim Birch and the, the Surf Center, Sensors for Underwater Research of the Future, they're developing um, more and more capable versions of the Environmental Sample Processor, ESP. It's an autonomous molecular analytical instrument that can acquire water samples, process them and either preserve them on board to return them to the shoreside laboratory or even uh, analyze samples on board and give you results. So in this experiment off Hawaii, we were simply uh, letting one vehicle go Lagrangian, drift passively while actually driving in small circles and so that it could track a population as it moved in an ocean eddy, while this vehicle provided continuous 
environmental context around the vehicle so that we could see the ecosystem processes driving microbial ec ecology on the drifting platform. And of course, MOLA as the communications gateway. So I hope I didn't go over. That's what I had. And if there is time, I'd be glad to answer questions. Thank you for that fantastic talk, Dr. Rain. That was really, really amazing technology out there. Um, I think we do have a question for you. Um, Arthur, did you raise your hand earlier? Yeah, sorry. Um, just a real quick question I asked in the chat there. Have there been any issues operating the AV in high traffic areas like channels, shipping lanes, et cetera, et cetera? There are always issues with that. And yet we've been incredibly fortunate. We've even operated down near the port of LA. I mean, so we've de we've put it out there and and there have been times when we have lost communication with a vehicle for a time, but we've always gotten it back. Uh, in one, one case, a, a fisherman dropped it on the dock near our institute, left it there for us. So, uh, but that, that said, you know, we try to keep the vehicles off the surface. When, when I'm standing watch for one of these long range vehicles, I'm continuously keeping an eye on it, but it also sends me warning message th messages that could wake me up while I'm asleep to say, hey, I'm sitting on the surface. And that's our goal. Keep them off the surface and they're much safer. Um, so yeah, the, but you're you're right on. We, we have to be really careful about vessel traffic and uh, yeah. Um, I think we'll take maybe one more question, maybe two. Um, I know, Wim, you have your hand raised. Yeah, hi. I sort of follow up question. <clears throat> What do you think about using a vehicle like this in really turbid water? Uh, and the turbid shallow, turbid shallow and highly tidal water. <laughs> How shallow is shallow? Uh, let's say five to 20 meters. Okay, well, the uh, long range AV and ESP teams have been doing work in Lake Erie, really shallow water. Um, you know, I think that when we when we think about these applications, the the effective process is always to define what are the questions, um, which define how you would need that platform to behave, how you would need it to acquire and preserve or process samples, and it, it's um, so. If I think of a, an environment five to twenty meters deep, strong tidal currents, uh, they are propeller driven. They have long endurance. They can handle that. If if vessel traffic, as was brought up, is a uh, is is very uh, intense, uh, that is a factor, especially because we can't, you know, the vehicle is going to be near the surface because of the shallow environment. But you know, we've operated them when in one of those surveys I showed us running along the 12 meter isopath. That first survey where it did geographic sampling, it it yo-yoed up and down along the 12 meter isopath. So it's doable, and and really many of the questions come down to uh, how many samples do you need um, if you if you want to move from sh ship operations only to ship an AUV? How do you allocate the sampling requirements to those different platforms as they do them best? Things like that. Thank you. Great. So thank you, Dr. Ryan, for that fantastic talk. Again, um, we do have a few questions in the chat that are directed to you if you wanted to uh, engage with folks. Um, we're going to move on to our final speaker for our session today, and that's Dr. Mark Oman, who is a distinguished professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And he'll be talking a little bit about the Zoe Glider. So all yours, Dr. Oman. Well, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Sam, for the invita invitation to speak. I warned him at the outset that I'm a, an oceanic zooplankton ecologist, but I think we agreed that uh, I would give the presentation anyway, and hopefully this will stimulate your thinking irrespective of the depth scales involved. Um, my motivation in leading the development of the zoo glider was an instrument for non-invasive autonomous in situ sensing of zooplankton and marine snow at the scale of predator-prey interactions. Now, the realization <clears throat> of this dream and scheme is entirely thanks to the brilliant engineers 
in the instrument development group at Scripps that's led by Russ Davis and Jeff Sherman. Now, the Zoe glider is built on the hull of a pre-existing glider that IDG designed and built. That's hey, the Mark. spray glider. Mark, <clears throat> I'm excuse me. Um, Mark, which I'm is about two. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so, so, sorry, Mark. This is Sam. I think uh, we have the screen sharing issue that we encountered earlier. Oh, um, dear. Yeah, we, we only see your title page, if you wouldn't mind stopping sharing um, and switching okay. over, or you can just flip through them right here if that's easier for you. Well, I think we'll try to... We can see the Zoe glider now, the slide with the picture of the instrument. Okay, how unfortunate. I thought we sorted that part out. Um, let me go back here. I think I will end this and stop screen share and then i will start screen share and take the screen perfect yeah okay so there we go. Um, full screen now good yeah so thank you this is the hall of the basic spray glider and the what makes it a zone glider the innovations are the development of a shadow graph imaging system on the nose, we call it ZOCAM, and a dual frequency custom uh, sonar system on the tail with, at 200 and 1000 kilohertz. Now, um, this is, it was designed uh, for adaptive sampling. It's navigable via the internet. We have full two-way communications using the Iridium satellite uh, telemetry system. Every time it surfaces, we talk to it, it talks to us. It is not an AUV, endurance vehicle that's intended for sustained missions. Now here's a typical Zoe glider dive profile. Um, it dives in this case, typically to 400 meters depth, but one could change the scale. Um, the instruments, the science payload is, is mainly turned off on descent with the exception of the 200 kilohertz transducer which we use as an altimeter. And this is very useful because we can safely navigate in areas with sea mounts. So we've had two missions in the La Jolla Canyon with complex bathymetry. When we reach the nadir point of the dive, alter the buoyancy, um, then the, si the science instruments are powered on ascent. The ascent occurs on average at about 10 centimeters per second. With a two hertz frame rate on the camera, this means we have approximately five centimeter uh, vertical resolution from 400 meters to the sea surface. Now, the Zonar um, is a, a custom design built and poured system uh, that, that uh, we, we built at Scripps uh, with it, these two sound frequencies, moderately high frequencies. They're shown here in the lower panel, the schematic location in the Zoglider payload bay uh, facing downward. The Zoglider ascends at an average angle of 17 degrees off the vertical. Recently, we've added passive acoustics as well. That's a hydrophone here, an Akusan hydrophone. Um, but with respect to the active acoustics, the key to using the difference between these, the, the 200 and 1000 kilohertz backscatter is to have appropriate backscattering models for different organisms that might be sensed. And these are just the um, DWBA backscattering model projections by an excellent zo um, zooplankton postdoc in my lab, Sven Gastauer, and to, to show the differential backscatter. And I want to clarify that we don't try to invert the backscatter field to solve for these different zooplankton types. Um, we use it for a simpler objective to try to resolve larger and smaller sources of backscatter. Now with the passive acoustics, which we've introduced only this year, we've had two zooglider emissions. Uh, this is an example of the Akusan recording processed by my colleague, Simone Bauman Pickering. Uh, this is just two minutes or so of the recording. And uh, when, as soon as she began looking at the data, she said, Mark, your part of the canyon was, was filled with sounds of blue whales. And this is a characteristic ABAB sequence, uh, according to Simone, who's very knowledgeable. This is a, a characteristic of a blue whale song. And we've only just begun um, the, the mammal side of the work and the potential mammal interactions with the zooplankton. Then the optical imaging system, the zoocam. It's a shadow graph imaging system. 
We have only black and white images, and that's intentional. It's, uh, it's low power, um, simple, uh, not quite as simple as modern systems, um, but there's a, there's a red light uh, beam here. It's, it illuminates 250 milliliters uh, at a time, or it illuminates that continuously. And then organisms flowing through the light path are imaged, whether it's organisms or marine snow. And the key of, with this design is that we use a collimated light source. So the lens is telecentric. And this means that if there's a copepod located here, I hope you can see my porter, pointer, the copepod located here or here or here, it has the same size in the shadow graph image, irrespective of its location in the light beam. Anyone who puts optical instruments in the ocean has to think about biofouling, they should, and we mitigate biofouling with two approaches. One is an ultraviolet LED here um, that shines on both windows and then custom bio wipers that um, we designed and built. Okay, so what do we get when we um, take these shadow graph images? This is just a spectrum, a little taste uh, of some of the multicellular zooplankton. Uh, there are many stories that can be told about each one of these image, but, uh, images, but I haven't the time. But let me point out that for this harpactocoid copepod aegisthus, for this calenoid copepod par probably heterorhabdus, for a uh, big predatory copepod Yukita, we see the caudal CT intact, which we almost never find in uh, net collected samples. The appendicularians, uh, many of them in houses, and the lots of fine structures visual, vi visible. In addition to the multicellular zooplankton, many larger protistins um, are, are recognizable. Here, especially the mineralized protists, and here's some colonial radi radiolarians or colodaria in the upper right, some acantherians here, uh, theodarians, silicious theodarians, um, many of them mesopelagic, and then some larger forearms. But in addition to the organisms, of course, there's the ubiquitous marine snow. These um, particular ROEs, or regions of interest, as we call them, um, are the larger uh, elements of snow, the larger organic aggregates. Of course, there's a, a size spectrum and many, many, many um, very small particles. But you even just looking at the slice of the larger snow, you see the, the extraordinary morphological diversity uh, that we encounter. And you can tell that some of the snow, for example, this, I'm near the upper left, if you can see my pointer. Um, this looks to me like relatively fresh snow. It's probably diatom chains that are beginning to aggregate. If we go toward the lower right, on the other hand, this looks like more mature snow, this and this, that probably reflect um, protistin and bacterial reworking. And there's a lot to be done on the subject of snow and snow zooplankton interactions. And because I know many of you are clodosterin lovers, um, I have an image here. This was done in the laboratory. All the others were in situ in the ocean. Uh, this was a culture of Daphnia that my colleague John Churin at UCSD brought down. And there's some pretty respectable images of Daphnia. Okay, so when we have these um, this, these images, and you know we now have tens of, tens of millions, if not more, um, what do we do with them? And it's essential to use efficient machine learning techniques both computer vision and machine learning, actually. And the, the easier part of the problem is the, the computer vision segmentation problem, where we recognize regions of interest here, 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 and then we pass them to, um, to our algorithm for classification. And here's where we use what I call advanced machine learning. We use convolutional neural networks, as many people do, but thanks to the innovations uh, int introduced by Jeffrey Ellen, who earned his PhD in my lab, working also in computer sciences and engineering at UCSD, we incorporate context metadata in the identification of the organisms. And the metadata, what I mean by context metadata is in the panel to the left, we have both geotemporal data and hydrographic data measured by the zooglider itself. Now what's the, the matrix in the middle here is called the confusion matrix. Uh, without, I know you can't read the labels. The important point is that um, if your algorithm is doing well and predicting your class as well, then everything will fall in the diagonal. Um, now that ne never happens, but in this case, as what, what we published a year and a half ago, 
incorporating context metadata, we were able to get up to about 92% accuracy, 92% of the categories um, of the individual ROIs correctly classified using 27 classes. And this delta here, the orange bars, show you the particular classes where the context, context metadata helped matters. And um, we do much better than e Ecotaxa does, by the way. And my recommendation for anyone who's working on uh, image processing and handling is to team up with expert, experts in machine learning because uh, you will go farther faster. This is an indication of where we are today, I guess, in contrast to what I showed you, which was a year and a half ago. Now we're up to about 95% accuracy with 52 classes, again, with the incorporation of metadata with our CNNs. Okay, so what are we starting to learn from leaving the technology aside? Um, what, what are we learning differently um, that's changing our thinking, or certainly changing my thinking about zooplankton interactions in the ocean. And one of them is reflected by this image. It's actually not a reflection, it's a shadow. We don't use reflected light. But the, the point is that, that the available prey, in this case, available phytoplankton prey, um, can be only sometimes only a fraction of the total phytoplankton assemblage. And uh, this, in this case, I've circled an append appendicularian that we've imaged. This particular one is not in its house, though many of the ones we image are. But in the background, you see these long filamentous diatoms, chains of various lengths. And the significant point is that the diatoms that are, are collected by virtually any method, collection method never appear this long. Um, they're damaged, they're broken, they're fragmented. And our perception is that the, the phytoplankton have a very different size spectrum that's probably more available to the zooplankton than um, our perception when we image both the, the phytoplankton chains and the zooplankton in situ. Um, similarly, the same point made um, uh, now with uh, a few different copepod taxa. In this lower panel, there's an oithona here. In the same frame, a, a variety of elongate diatom chains. And uh, my contention is that this is prey that's essentially unutilizable to this organism, especially since Oithona tends to prefer motile cells. But even if we look at, uh, at this small calanoid here, or the Calanus pacificus, that seems to be an adult female over on the left, that um, the, the size spectrum of the prey is largely unutilizable um, even by the chopsticks feeding method to these zooplankters. So that's a rather different perspective. Another perspective, a new, new way of looking at things, comes from the benefit of in situ imaging. Um, in this case, with foraminifera. On the left is a, the type specimen of a mesopelagic foram, Hastrogerinella digitata, uh, collected by a net and uh, preserved and then drawn in the laboratory by Rumbler, published in 1911. And this is the type specimen. Okay, on the right, now well, I don't know for certain that we have Hastrogerinella digitata. Um, it uh, certainly is a Hastrogerinid foram. But the important point is that our, in imaging the organisms in situ, we see the, um, the full length of the rigid calcium carbonate, carbonate spines, but more importantly, these flexible rhizopodia. And if you um, do this quantitatively and incorporate both the, the spines and rhizopods as a devices to increase the effective search volume for prey by the forearms, we find that, that the in situ imaging reveals that they have the, in, the encounter volume that's about a thousand to or a hundred to a thousand fold greater than you would estimate from the test size alone. So the forearms are probably much more important consumers than we expect. Now the case of a small hydromedusa, you can probably barely see it, but it's right here in the upper right. Um, in many times in preserved plankton samples, especially um, 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 ocean samples, we see ubiqu ubiquitous small hydromedusae, about a millimeter in diameter in this case, in belt diameter. And the obvious question is, well, what pre predation impact do these little guys have um, given the small, um, small potential range of uh, prey encounter? If you image them in situ with the zooglider, we find that this little, little hydromedusa 
has feeding tentacles that can be 10 to 20 times the length of the animal, markedly increasing the prey encounter volume again. In the case of tenophores, um, tenophores sometimes are notoriously difficult to preserve properly, but if done properly, one, and you're lucky, you'll see the tentacles, which are these dark um, features extending from the animals. Usually in preserved specimens, if the tentacles are intact, they're retracted up uh, into tentacle sheaths, but visible nonetheless. What you don't see are the fine, very fine gray secondary tentilla that branch off the tentacles. We look over here at this, this is an undescribed sedipid tenophore on the left. This dramatic increase in potential encounter um, surface and encounter volume with prey. And again, suggesting that these are more important predators than expected. Another different perspective we have, and this really woke me up, um, was in comparing the zooglider um, measured abundances. This is, uh, these are actually concentrations, vertical concentrations uh, by zooglider with a classical sampling method, vertically stratified mock nest sample. And these, the net, the net mesh size is 202 micrometers here. Uh, we've been the zooglider data in the same depth strata as the mock nest. So this is a, a kumquats to kumquats depth comparison, if you will. The mock nest vertical profiles are in uh, black and the zooglider in gray. And for five of the eight major taxa um, visualized, there are markedly higher concentrations of the zooplankton in the, um, the as measured by zooglider than in the mock nest. This is true in both day profiles and night profiles. Now, take note of the scale here. If we drop to the, the lower, lower panel, the maximum concentration of copepods in uh, this zooglider profile was about 5,000 per cubic meter or about five per liter. But bear in mind that that's when we bin the data so that they, are, um, they correspond to the coarse depth sampling of the mock nest, about five per liter. And appendicularians looks like about 600 per cubic meter or 0.6 per liter. Now, if we take advantage of the real the benefit of the zooglider, one of the reasons we designed it in the first place, and that's to be able to resolve the fine scale vertical um, dispersion patterns of organisms, we find that the maximum copepod densities in those very profiles were about up to about 76 individuals per liter, not five per liter, but up to 76. Now these, um, for those of you who work in the San Francisco estuary, this may not be too, these numbers may not be too surprising. For those of us who work in oceanic regions, it's very surprising. The appendicularians up to about 19 or so individuals per liter instead of 0.6 per liter. And so these thin layers um, are not resolvable by, by classical sampling methods. They're almost certainly resolvable by um, plantivorous fishes and plantivorous carnivorous zooplankton. And this changes uh, our thinking about predator-prey interactions and some biogeochemical issues. Now, um, finally, um, one of the benefits of the, the zonar that we have on the zoo glider um, is the first point is that we're putting our instruments, our high, moderate to high frequency uh, transducers um, on the instrument and taking the instruments down to 400 meters. If you used a ship mounted sonar, a classical sonar or a bottom mounted upward looking um, sonar, you would you would not you couldn't possibly get the sound energy to penetrate as deep as 400 meters. The the thousand kilohertz system might penetrate um, 10 or 20 meters at best. So um, we have the ability to resolve um, structures, organisms, and features in subsurface. Now this is just one brief mission in San Diego Trough, about 30 kilometers or so west of the Scripps Pier. This is, uh, these are nine day records at 1000 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz. Um, the obvious pattern is of course the dial vertical migration, the DVM pattern, but they're not so obvious. You look a little more closely and you see that there are differences at the two frequencies between about 200 to 250 meters depth um, uh, by day in particular. And by the way, this is the day night bar at the top. 
um, there's a layer of backscatter at, two, at 1000 kilohertz that is largely missing at 200 kilohertz. If we go to the far right panel, where we have now the dB difference, we're taking the difference between these two um, uh, sonograms. Uh, this should be interpreted as the, the teal color is indicative of regions where the smaller acoustic backscatters dominate, and the red, the yellow to red, uh, where the larger acoustic backscatters dominate. And sure enough, if you look be at this 200 to 250 meter layer, you see by day, this is a layer that's dominated by, um, by smaller sources of backscatter. At night, they tend to come up somewhat shallower in the water column. Conversely, the largest, larger acoustic backscatters are typically a little bit deeper um, by day and also typically a little bit deeper at the night. At night, in other words, there's a size-dependent DVM response, and we can resolve this in real time when the gliders at sea. So, in summary, um, we've uh, we've developed an instrument that non-invasively senses the zooplankton both optically and acoustically. Uh, the, the use of deep learning, uh, especially using context metadata, has uh, has really been a game changer in terms of a volume of image handling. Um, we're starting to change uh, our perspectives on a variety of ecological issues, and these are uh, stress that we're making measurements on the scale relevant to the organisms, and this opens uh, new doors now for adaptive sampling of zooplankton in situ. And here are a few uh, recent papers that um, go into a little more detail on some of the subjects that I've just briefly touched upon. All right. Thank you, Dr. Owen. That was a fantastic talk and very, very interesting. Everyone was excited about those beautiful photos. <laughs> um, we're coming up on kind of the end of our session and day for today. And so I encourage anyone who has questions for Dr. Omen to bring up either um, tomorrow or, you know, through our Google groups uh, where we can continue these discussions. But I'm going to hand it over to Sam now to kind of um, walk us out here. Thank you to all the speakers. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Um, and thanks, everyone. That was a really amazing and inspiring session. Um, and I think, you know, from the chat, you can see that a lot of people are really excited about all these ideas that we're hearing. Um, so just a reminder that we'll be starting up bright and early tomorrow morning at 8.30. Um, and we're going to hear about a lot of uh, more academic research on zooplankton from our system as well as from other systems. Um, and there are a lot of really exciting speakers that we have lined up. Um, it'll be on this exact same meeting link uh, that we're using right now. So we will see you all then. Um, and like Geneva said in the chat, please feel free to keep continuing the discussion on Twitter if you use the hashtag ZoopSimp2020. Um, and if you want to join the Google group, I'll post the link to that again so we can try to continue this conversation into the future. Thanks, everyone.